So I need to step away from the uh, chairman position, and somebody else will need to be uh, take this position temporarily. I'll nominate Mark Guidoboni as chairman pro tem. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. All right. Switch. Aye. Thank you very much. Don't go too far. Yeah. <coughs> what, we're going to change it to that desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drink your coffee. <laughs> hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we understand we have some uh, public participation tonight, and, uh, and we all want to hear from everybody. In lieu of that, we're uh, going to try to keep our comments to a two to three minute uh, each. Um, hopefully, everybody will have an opportunity to do that in a particular order. Um, and understand also that uh, we are um, do not have uh, agenda items that support what we may hear you say tonight. So we can listen to your input, but we're not really allowed uh, legally to comment or to make any votes. So uh, I share your frustration, but that's our open meeting laws here in the state of Massachusetts. So we'll be moving forward. Do we have any uh, public participation? Uh, we can go with a show of hands. Who would like to speak? Over here. At uh, the end, Coach. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Giacomo. I'm the head football coach here at Silver Lake. I want to thank all the school committee members for this opportunity to speak to you in this forum and express some of our thoughts and feelings regarding the light situation on Syracuse Field. Tonight I'm joined by members of our girls and boys soccer team, um, members of some of the lacrosse teams, uh, many of my football players, as you can see with a sea of red, um, and some of my coaches, um, some rep representatives from Kingston Youth Football, parents, and other members of the community. As you can see from this turnout, this is a very important issue to us for many reasons. And some of those reasons, I think, haven't been considered yet. So that's what we wanted to represent to you this evening. The coaches, all the coaches here at Silver Lake, are committed to helping our young men and women, or our kids become young men and women, through character development, teaching them structure, discipline, focusing on academics and leadership. And I can't think of a better way of having our young people demonstrate leadership than to get up in front of you this evening and express for all of us our feelings and concerns. So I have two young men from our program that we selected to speak to you. The first one is Dominic Sheehan, stand up Dominic. He's a sophomore student athlete in our football program. And additionally, we have Bobby Olson, who's a junior student athlete in our football program. Uh, they'd like to say a few words, and then I would respectfully ask, once they complete, I had a few things I'd like to summarize afterwards, so I'd appreciate it if we could do that. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to, to, speak to you, and I think we'll start with Dominic. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. I have a hand up that's going to be passed around. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Dominic Sheehan and I'm a sophomore on the Silver Lake football team. We have gathered over a thousand signatures from students and residents of the district to ask the school committee to present, uh, to enter a lease, a seven year lease that we have lights installed on Syracuse, sorry, excuse me, Syracuse Field by the beginning of the 2018-2019 fall season for football, boys soccer, girls soccer, and cheerleading and band. Additionally, the lights used um, for senior nights for both field, for field hockey, boys lacrosse, and girls lacrosse. We also have a signature from Mrs. Sirico, whose field, the field is uh, members, remembered by her family, her husband. Uh, we are the only school in the Patriot League that does not have a turf field that can be used year round. We will now also be the only school without lights. We are not, we're not asking for a turf field at the cost of over a million dollars. We are just asking to have the lights on the field that were already there. As the fall season goes on, many of the teams must practice under the lights. Football games would now be moved to Saturdays and boys and girls soccer games would, be, would compete for game time during the weekdays. Game revenue for the school would decrease as parents and spectators would be unable to attend during the workday. All sports teams must do their own fundraising to operate for the year. 
This is on top of fees paid by parents. For example, football players must fundraise approximately $350 per season for each person. This fundraising pays for the following. New weights in the weight room, coaching stipends for several coaches not paid for by the school committee, newer, safer pads, helmets, field equipment, workout gear, and much more. We are extremely appreciative for the facilities and maintenance that are currently provided for various sports. However, we feel that this burden is being placed on specific teams that use the field alone. The school committee has always looked out for the athletic programs and activities equally of having each sport provide and not having each sport provide necessary equipment for themselves. We currently have a group of parents attempting to do fundraising, but it will take, to, um, but it will take years to raise over $200,000. The players currently in the high school will never see these lights that we fundraise for. The fundraising and applying for grants will continue, but we don't see a way to reach this goal in the short term. Again, we are asking the school committee to enter a lease to buy agreement for the, for the lights over a seven year term using the originally allocated $100,000 as a down payment. Our goal is to fundraise and meet the first annual payment of approximately $37,000 by July 2019. We will continue to solicit sponsors for the lights and that sheet that we, for soliciting sponsors is attached. Um, below, there are towns that we play and are just in the local area that all have lights whether they are portable, rented units, or permanent. We also have planned fundraising that are ongoing, such as a sponsorship drive, as the form is attached, grant writing, parent alumni prom, GoFundMe campaign, and Patriot All-Star game. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bobby Olson. I'm currently a junior and will be playing my final season of high school football this coming fall. First off, I'd like to thank the school and district for allowing us to be here tonight to push for something we all deeply cherish. As a senior to be here at Silver Lake, following playing a long, hard 10 years of football in the Silver Lake district, this sport is something anticipated by this area every autumn. And I'm not just speaking for myself. Our community, our parents, your friends show up and show out every Friday night to watch our football games, whether we're the visitors of another school or playing up there at Sierra Field. Everyone's support is so well appreciated by us, no matter where we're playing, but especially so at home games here at the lake each and every Friday night. Our mothers screeching across the field, cheering us on, town regulars coming to watch their sons and their sons' friends, sections full of screaming students, all wonderful sights and sounds that all 60 plus of us players look forward to every Friday night. I simply can't imagine how the magnitude of each game would drop significantly, having all of this gone on Saturday afternoon. Less attendance and lesser intensity would affect us all, not only football players, it just wouldn't be the same feeling as a student athlete to wear my bright red jersey to school on Fridays, beaming with pride for who and what I represent, just to play the following day on a lazy Saturday afternoon. The reality is I'm rolling in my final year here at Silver Lake this upcoming September. A little over a year from now, I'll be walking across the stage on the beloved Syracuse field draped in a red graduation gown with a fitting red cap. After I graduate, I want to have had the best experience I could possibly, I could have possibly had as a student athlete after spending four years of my life here including a deserving senior night for all athletes, not limited to just football players. Future football, soccer, and lacrosse senior players all share the same dream of playing one last home game, shining under those bright lights while being honored for their four years of dedication to their school. Taking this away from us is simply taking away from our high school experience, something this school takes incredibly seriously. In fact, our school mission statement mentions a supportive learning environment while promoting integrity and growth, to paraphrase. To go on to the extent of our mission statement and finish strong our senior school motto, it would be most plausible to purchase these lights as a way to fully support our student body. We brought a, a long list of petitions with us to display our public opinion on how much we want these lights, a sign of integrity, outlined in the mission statement. But more so, I want to look back on the memories of representing the community I live in, the family that raised me and the coach that continued to turn us into the great young men we've become. I even dressed in a suit and tie without being asked by Coach D here. How much better of an impression can I expect? <laughs> Agreeing to put up these lights would mean so much to the young men here tonight, as well as the rest of the school in its well-respected environment and community. <coughs> but it's about more than just granting us the money. You cannot put a price on heart, and that's what our football team preaches and portrays more than any team I've ever seen together. And I bet you can hold the same opinions if you've seen us compete day in and day out. There are guys in this room who would run through a brick, brick wall for one another's respect and trust, and Friday nights highlight that. Guys that would play in a game despite such terrible family tragedies. So Tanner Boyd, a man I'm fortunate to call one of my best friends, 
touch not only my heart, but each and every spectator's hearts last year. Just hours after losing his stepfather, John Adams, to cancer, Tanner showed up at, the at that school that Friday to play all of her Ames High School before everyone else, with puffy red eyes from grief, ready to play a game that I've never seen anybody. Tanner was unanimously chosen as game day captain, an honorary role on our team every Friday night. Also our quarterback, Tanner played his guts out for us, taking hit after hit and making pass after pass along the way to loss on our shoulders. He was our hero on the 15th of September last fall, and resembles the ideal man in our lives, one who puts all his struggles aside and sacrifices any adversity to live and take action for other people. Experiences like Tanner do not occur every night, and I also were lucky enough to have witnessed that that night. You see, this sport isn't something we just play because it's entertaining. We want to represent our fans with utmost integrity while displaying our rectitude and good character, participating in the sport we all love to be a part of. The scene of this is most appealing underneath those infamous Friday night lights, in front of all of you, representing all of all of with you with paramount respect that you highly deserve. I can still remember seven-year-old me with aspirations of playing with all my friends under those big lights. And flashing forward 10 years to now, a 17-year-old could potentially not have another evening home game. Nothing's changed. These lights would forever hold a place in my heart because of the scene they would set for a school that has definitely earned such elegance and dignity. On behalf of our football pro program and all our student athletes, agreeing to purchase these lights left will have us persisting to shine a light on the community and school we anticipate playing for every Friday night during the fall. It would instill a vehemence within us all that would be difficult to overthrow by any other team. Light up the lake and make it bright so we can make you proud every Friday night. Roll late. I want to thank Bobby and Dominic for representing us so well this evening. Um, I'm just going to be real quick with this, but the, the issue of the lights on Circle is, is, is a complex issue. And it's more than just saying, well, well you're just going to have to play during the day. It's truly become the standard here at Silver Lake for 33 years. There's a number of things I'm concerned about, and some of these haven't been considered. And the first thing, as a coach, is my primary focus is the safety of our kids. And us having to play day games on Saturday changes things dramatically compared to every single team in the league from a safety standpoint. And I'll explain why. Every school in the Patriot League plays Friday night games. And they all play their JV games on Saturday. And there's a reason for that. That's pretty much the, the standard along, or across the state. Most teams play Friday night. So if we have to play Saturday afternoon games, our kids that play a little bit in the varsity game and a little bit in the JV game will have to play Monday JV games. And we have quite a few of those kids, as do probably 90% of the schools in Massachusetts. But this is where it becomes a problem. You play Saturday, you play Monday, and then we're going to have to turn around and play a Friday night game away. You're going to ask those boys to play three games or participate in a portion of three games within six plus days. That, to me, is a concern. And I think that's something that has to be considered. And it's something that no other school in our league deals with. They have set the standard that they play Friday night. They play JV games on Saturday, and there's a reason for that. The second issue, not as important as safety, but it's, it's an issue. It's a competitive issue. All right, so all these teams in our league play Saturday JV games. We're going to have to play on Monday. So I have to compete against Duxbury, Whitman, Hanson, Plymouth North, and the like. But I'm going to lose half my team every Monday. So I'm going to have one last day of full practice to compete against all the other teams in the Patriot League. Now I understand that winning isn't everything, but I think we've really worked hard to bring some pride back into Silver Lake football. And that's been culminated with two playoff wins under the lights at home the last two years. And it puts these boys at a disadvantage, and it makes it much more difficult for us to compete. And that's, 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 that's a concern. The loss of revenue to the athletic department is something that shouldn't be overlooked. You're going to lose money because people won't attend Saturday afternoon games. Friday Night Lights is a community event, and it's going to raise so much more money. This isn't just a football issue. Soccer plays actually more games on that field than football does. And if parents can't come to see their kids, they're going to have to play games at 3.30 in the afternoon, and as daylight savings happens, they might have to start games at 3 o'clock. And there's going to be a lot of people that don't show up for those games, and that is going to be hit in the athletic department budget, and then the school committee is going to have to supplement that by further funds to the athletic department. There's 29 high schools in Plymouth County, and 27 of them played nighttime football games at home last year. 
The only schools that did were South Shore Votech that was built in 1962 and Sacred Heart of Kingston. And in a proud regional school district like this, I think our student athletes deserve better. Lastly, we're not asking for something that we never had. We're not asking for a turf field. It's been the standard here for 33 years to have nighttime games for soccer and football and other events. And we're just asking to have what we have. But I'm concerned because it looks like we may be being asked, soccer and football, to fund almost $200,000 of this. And my understanding was there was money in the past for this because this isn't a new thing that just propped up on us. People knew this was going to happen. Now, I also understand that you have to make tough decisions as a school committee. And, you know, I appreciate that. So that money needed to be allocated other places. But the reality is it's not feasible for us to raise $200,000. And I don't think it's equitable for one reason. I really don't think you would ask the kids that participate in drama to pay for new lights in the auditorium or to pay for a new sound system or structural repairs. I don't think you'd ask the basketball kids to pay for the hardwood floors to be refinished or to pay for a leaky roof or electrical repairs. So it seems like it's a significant burden put on two, two scholastic programs that we just can't handle. We will do our best to fund this. We absolutely will in good faith. But it's just not feasible for us to raise $200,000. I understand this is a difficult thing, and you all have a very difficult job. And you, do, you work really hard for the district and for every kid in it. I just like to think that there's some way that we can find a solution to this so we can continue this tradition that we've had here for over three decades. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to our fun young men. And um, I hope that we can collectively find a way to, sol to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak on the public? Sir? Uh, uh, Joseph Finn played here in 2010. I came back. It's nothing like driving night lights. Uh, I play semi pro right now. Uh, currently for the South Coast Outlaws. Um, first and foremost, you have to think about the play of safety. So you push those games to Saturday. Some of those guys are going both ways, special teams, offense, defense. And Monday, they're going to suit up for a JV game. Some plays cross over. You have to think about the play of safety first and foremost, the concussions and everything. I've dealt with it. Um, some effects I still have to this day, but I still play the game because I love it. Uh, not the beats Friday night lights. Uh, some of the guys that played with the semi pro, they played pro. And uh, we take bus trips up to Maine and everything. And they said, it's not like that. Uh, even you think about the kids' safety, Friday night lights was an outlet for me. You know, what could I have done Friday night? I could have done so much stuff and got me in trouble. And, uh, and, you know, if it wasn't for football, I, I probably wouldn't do that. To be honest with you. And, uh, you know, we just got to think about the kids. The school community's got to think about that. And uh, I'll be the first one, you know, coming every game, Friday Night Lights, nothing like that. I just want to put that in perspective. Thank you. And uh, you guys all have a tough job, but you got to think about the kids, first and foremost. And thank you. Hi, I'm Jared Snell. I'm a father. I'm also an alumni of the Soberly football team. Um, I've had two sons graduate um, from the football program. One in the football program and one coming up soon. <laughs> um, I would like to second what he said about Friday nights. Um, I always know where my sons are on Friday night during football season. Um, it's, there's a lot of dangerous stuff out there, and kids are making bad choices. And this is a one positive um, that we can trust. A um, couple of points. I played here when the lights got installed. Um, I think it was my junior year. And there was a difference between the number of people in the stands on Saturday mornings versus Friday nights. Second, I believe the soccer boosters clubs paid for the lights initially. And the school's athletic department has benefited greatly by the um, increased numbers um, and 
blue schools. Neglectful to let the you know quality or the structural quality of the poles um, lapse over these years. And it should have been your responsibility to take care of it. Um, so I agree with what Coach Giacomo said. It's a big burden to put on programs that are struggling financially already. Um, they don't get money from the gate that's getting taken out. Um, they have to fundraise their own money. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to add anything that has been said? <coughs> um, would personally like to thank the students that took the initiative and the courage to stand up and speak tonight. I know it's not an easy thing to do, and uh, specifically, um, you should be commended for organizing. Your words were well focused and spoken, and I appreciate the fact that our students are so outgoing, and a petition is not an easy thing to do, and I appreciate that. Can't comment too much further, but I would like to, to recognize the fact that uh, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And also to every member of the team that's here today, it took your effort to come out tonight and to represent uh, your school, and it is appreciated that you're here tonight. And uh, thank you very much, for all of you, for coming and sharing your comments. Chair back, Mr. Cole. I did not drink your coffee. <laughs> you sure? So the only, uh, I will just add, um, we're, as Mr. Guidboni said, we won't be able to take any action, any vote on this tonight. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll have another meeting in, in June. We meet uh, uh, every month. Um, so, you guys are all welcome to stay for our meeting, but if you'd like to go home and do your homework, that's fine. <laughs> you don't want to stay. Right. And yeah, just everybody's meeting is going to go about three hours. So. Thanks for coming, guys. All right, we're going to continue on with the meeting. Um, at this point, I would like to... I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Calter, he's here for a uh, presentation. So you have the floor, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, about 12 years ago, I sat on this board, and I, when I left, I went to the legislature. Mr. Guidoboni took my place. And now tonight is my last official act as a state legislator. And it's so coincidental and, and so ironic that my last act is to honor a man who I have great respect for who has done a remarkable <laughs> job in this school committee for over a decade. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recognize Mark, if you join me. I'd like to recognize Mark Rudaboni with the citation from the House of Representatives. Now, he's watched dozens of people receive citations. I don't believe he's ever received one, though. No, I don't think so. So I'd like to read to Mark. Be it hereby known to all in the Massachusetts House of Representatives Office, it's sincerest congratulations to Mark Rubani in recognition of 10 years uh, of commitment uh, I put my glasses on. <laughs> to Silver Lake Regional School Committee. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. Given this 10th day of May 2018, signed by Speaker of the House Robert A. DeLeo and your soon-to-be former state representative, uh, Thomas J. Coulter. Just a word, Mr. Chairman. These citations, which are given uh, to selected citizens across the Commonwealth, are given to people for extraordinary acts of kindness, generosity, heroism, uh, selflessness, and sometimes they're taken lightly. I want the folks to know that these citations are, are now, Mark will get one copy of this, the other copy will go in the archive uh, at the Massachusetts State House, next to the likes of citations given to people like Paul Revere, uh, John Hancock, uh, John Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King, and yes, Mark Wade. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, thank you.
Scouts and 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 Scouts
Um, our show's this coming uh, next weekend, the 19th and 20th. Uh, and we still have tickets available at the door if you want to see it. Thank you. That's not the word. Who's the word? Unless I'm very much mistaken, I think it's wrong in the When trying to express to himself, it's frankly quite absurd. Taking through lengthy lexicons to find the perfect word. A little spontaneity keeps conversation key. Even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious You can tell the fragile as you can be out of doors I'm delivered, I'm delighted, I'm delivered, I'm delighted I'm delivered, I'm delighted, I'm delivered, I'm delighted I'm delivered, I'm delivered, I'm delivered, I'm delivered, I'm Motion to accept and hold our executive session minutes from Thursday, April 12, 2018. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Abstain. An abstention. Mr. Chair? Yes. Can I make a motion to take another item out of order, please? Sure, let's hear it. We have our district auditors here, and I would love to allow Grady to make this presentation and depart the premises at the time. All right, do I hear a second? Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstain? All right, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jason. 
My name is Randy Carter. I'm with the um, audit firm Lynch Marini and Associates. We're the district's auditors, and I'm here tonight to um, give you a summary of the um, results of the fiscal 2017 audit of the district. Um, again, uh, I believe folks have a handout that kind of summarizes um, some of the key highlights. So the, the primary purpose of the audit every year is, is for us as the auditors to issue an independent audit report which expresses an opinion that on the district's financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, known as GAAP. Also, the audit is conducted in accordance with government auditing standards, which requires us to issue a, a report on internal controls over financial reporting and other matters that could have direct and material effect on the financial statements. Um, we are not expressing an opinion on the internal controls. Also, since the district expends more than $750,000 in federal awarded funds, a single audit is required, which is required to issue a report. We're required to report on compliance and internal controls over those compliance with requirements of major federal programs. In fiscal 17, the district had federal expenditures of $1.8 million. So the results of the audit, the financial statements, we issued an unmodified opinion which means that, the, in our opinion, the financial statements of the district are fairly stated in material respects in accordance with GAAP. Now, the financial statements themselves, the government-wide financial statements are presented on a full accrual basis. Everybody asks, what does that mean? Essentially, it's reporting all the district's assets and obligations, long-term or non-term. Aggregate net position of the district debt June 30th of 17 was $1.1 million. Net positions comprised of three components. Net, net investment in capital assets, restricted net position, and unrestricted net position. The largest component of the net position is $43.3 million, which represents the investment in capital assets, which were $55 million less the outstanding debt on those assets of $12 million in, in long-term bonds. Uh, restricted net position of $408,000 essentially represents the revolving funds of the district at June 30th. And the big one, the unrestricted net position is, was in a deficit of $42.6 million. Again, the key factors representing the deficit are the net OPEB liability of $40 million and the net pension liability of $6.4 million. Which, on a full accrual basis, the district saw the net position go down uh, approximately $2.8 million, which is essentially the effects of the changes in those liabilities for the fiscal year. Um, the fund financial statements are, are what most people are more familiar with and are close to the district's records themselves. The general fund at June 30th. Uh, it was $2.2 million, a slight decrease of about $5,000 from the prior year. Committed, committed fund balance of $662,000 is what the uh, community has appropriated for capital improvements of $637 and also the fiscal 2018 contribution to the OPEP of $25,000. Um, assigned, assigned fund balance of $119,000 represented carry over encumbrances into fiscal 18. And the remaining component, the unassigned fund balance of a million four, again on the state bar, you're essentially at the maximum that you could, could maintain. Um, so on the general fund side, you're, you're in good shape. The other governmental funds on the financial statements will put the aggregate fund balance of all the, the grants and the revolving funds, and that was at $353,000 of 17. Um, another schedule in, in the statements of the budgetary comparison schedule would show the results of the general fund on a budgetary basis. The district appropriated $25.7 million and spent $25.6. So we had a, a slight savings on the appropriations of about $99,000 uh, and a positive on, on the budgeted revenues with the departmental receipts as a result of um, net meeting credits and also the ongoing payment annually from Pembroke for retiree insurance. 
By reporting in accordance with government auditing standards, we did not report any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies as a result of our audit procedures, and we did not report any material non-compliance for the year. In regards to the single audit, the major program that was tested for fiscal 17 was the special education cluster, um, and we did not report any findings of direct material non-compliance, so again, something that, that the district wants to have. We did have a, a report and other matter finding, which was a, a carryover from the prior year. Again, just the, the continued recommendation that the, the internal control policies and procedures surrounding each grant compliance be more formally documented um, in accordance with OMB guidelines. Um, again, not a, not a significant issue, but um, again, it's, it's in, Essentially, common to all municipal entities that, that I audit, so that one is pretty much common to everybody. So, this is kind of a summary. Um, open for any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Um, does the board have any uh, questions? I would comment. just like to make a comment. Thank Reed again for his time. Uh, took some time out of his schedule to meet with me over the course of the year to explain a few things from. Uh, the financial side since I was our treasurer and expressed some issues and you know, some um, worries about my lack of understanding of grade. It was nice enough to, to take the time to explain any of those issues in layman's terms that were easy to understand, so I appreciate that. Well, we appreciate, we appreciate being in service to the district and appreciate the community having us well. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. no. Okay. So, um, Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, we do have another uh, right, presenter that made a scheduled appearance here for uh, our uh, presentation on solar. And I don't know if uh, the committee would uh, grace us with taking that one also out of order before we get into the yes. meeting. Um, we also have OPEP. Oh, you do? So you got mm -hmm. another one? Okay. Maybe after that. Thank you. Thought he was done. All right, so I, uh, do I have a motion to take uh, OPEP? So moved. All right, a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. So we have uh, Michelle Newcomb and Joshua Paul of Bartholomew and Company. And you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for having us this evening. Does everybody have a copy? Can you do it? So uh, I'm just going to do a very brief overview of who we are if you're not familiar. Uh, we are an independent investment advisory firm based in Worcester, Massachusetts. We've been in business since 1994. We currently have about 1.8 billion assets under management, of which over 1.1 billion represents municipal funds that we're investing for over 220 million in the state. Of that 1.1 billion, about 175 million represents OPEP funds that we're managing. About 100 million accounts. Um, some are school districts, some are water districts, and a lot of the big towns. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. We have a very deep understanding of Massachusetts. These things happen. So, so we have a deep understanding of national law and how it is which is what we provide to the district. So, um, with that, I will let Josh kind of get into the performance of the OPEC account, which we've been managing since December 16th, 2016. So, uh, my responsibility is within the company. There's a few of us that are on the investment team. Um, our job is to um, actually manage the funds that you entrust with us. So, uh, Michelle and I started working together in December of 2016. Um, I'll start off on page two again. I'm sure you've got other topics to than us. And your funds. So, so page two, you're going to see a breakdown. Top left hand corner is as of month end, April 30th. The other top corner is going to be as of the end of your prior fiscal year. Now, what you'll see is about 50% of your portfolio is in stock or equities. And so you've got a portfolio where half the portfolio is geared towards more risk but more return. The other half of the portfolio is geared towards less volatility and obviously lower return. So you've got a moderate portfolio is how we look at it. Um, so moderate, um, we have essentially five speeds, and you're at speed three right in the middle. 
Um, some communities start at two and they move up. Some communities start at three and stay where they are. But there, there is flexibility to move as you have more dollars, as you gain more comfort with the funds. Um, please don't take it as this is always set stone. Our job is to work with you, let you know the pros and cons of how you're currently invested, where the markets are now, where we think they might be, uh, and to help you manage these funds going forward. Okay. Uh, page three, you're going to see a history of the portfolio in a few different forms. Top left-hand side is going to be since inception. So you'll see that December 2016, um, the zero balance, net contribution since we started working together are $75,000. Your activity is listed underneath. And what you'll show there is near the third of the last line, $3,100 gain since inception. Works out to an 11% return in total, in aggregate, which is an almost an 8% annualized return since we started working together. Again, it's been a great market since we were working together, so please don't expect that every time we come back. <laughs> um, but it's, and, and by the way, that's for only half the portfolio being in the stock market. So that's a really good rate of return, given the level of risk you're taking. On the right-hand side, indicative of my point in the fact that things don't always work out perfectly all the time, we've had volatility now for the for, for three out of the four months of this year. February, March, and April have been unlike the prior year where you actually had the markets go down a little bit. And you had markets that didn't, didn't just keep going up day after day. So your return since the beginning of the fiscal year is just about four and a quarter. Okay, at the bottom of the page you'll see brown line represents what money you put in the portfolio, blue line is what's currently working. And I would just like to point out too, those return numbers are net of fees. Thank you, yes, so the returns are net of everything. Um, you pay us a annual management fee to manage these funds and make the investment selections. Um, those return numbers are net of everything. Net of those costs, net of the cost inside of the respective mutual funds. Um, so it's it's pure return to you. And there'll be no percentage, um, no incentive. Pages six and seven. So just to show you, not to make gloss over, but maybe just to show you the diversification that we have in the portfolio on the U.S. stock side the international stock side and then the bond and the alternative side. So we are not just buying a couple of positions. Hopefully we pick the absolute best places and make the return that way. We are diversifying the portfolio across different market caps, across international and domestic, and of course, stocks, bonds, and alternatives. So with that, I'll take any questions that you have. I don't want to. Uh, thank you. Um, I do have a question, then I'll open it up uh, to the committee. Um, on page three, it, we have withdrawals for um, uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side. What are the withdrawals for? Is it going to be any money that you might take, which obviously is the long term fund that you're not using, that would typically be your fees. Okay. That's you're going to see the fees coming out of the portfolio. Okay. I think you're at 30, you're going to be at 30, 35. So we take into account the business that we do with the, um, the member towns for the district, and right. we work with quite a few. So we, um, we put that into. Your fees now, again, we can uh, I, I think they're like 30 or 35. So 30 or 35 basis points. So one third of 1%. And okay. it's an all, are the way our fees work, it's an all encompassing fee. So it covers all the custodial charges, all the ticket charges, all the wire transfers, all the investment services. And then that is broken down to quarterly amounts. It's charged the first month of each quarter. We can get it right out of the earnings. And I have another question probably for our side, but who, who on our side is picking um, how, how aggressive we are, I think. Mm -hmm. Are you saying it's you? Or are you asking to speak? <laughs> I, I, I was involved in the decision okay. when we first put the open funds yep. into this fund. And it was a conversation that Christine and I had. Yep. And since we were beginning with it, we chose the moderate portfolio, uh, the mixture of the equities and the bonds to give ourselves that stability, but also realize some gain. Um, I would never advise us to try and chase returns, but at the same time, we have to cover fees. <coughs> so it seemed to be the happy medium ground. And we, if anything, I would want us to become more conservative as time goes on, not more aggressive. But I'm still comfortable with the current asset mixture that we have. I am not a financial planner. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, out of the 140 open accounts that we have, a majority are in the moderate model. 
either started there or moved up to moderate. And our models are a little more conservative <coughs> than other investment advisors might be as well. So it's actually a very appropriate place to be. my question. Pretty much across the board, those are the districts and, and other municipalities. That was the information that Christine also supplied to me when we first were going to allocate the funds and we picked the organization to do business with. She right. brought to me communities around us that already worked with them and also had similar fund structures. So Christine gave me all the information and I made the decision. You need to help with the resources available. Right. <laughs> yeah, do you have a comment? Yeah, how are we uh, comparing to the other customers with contribution? Like, considering when we started getting into it. Yeah, and, and I think as far as uh, school districts go, you know, <coughs> similar, actually. We have a lot that are kind of in this, this yeah. category of size. You know, it's... Um, I guess what I'm asking, is there any school systems that are aggressively get, giving into this, or there are a few? It depends on the computer. Um, I was out of the meeting this morning in Natick um, with a collaborative, and they have um, a number of communities Again, I don't know your particular um, financial structure. Yeah. Um, they're at a point now where they're between 19 and 21 percent funded on their um, unfunded accrued, actual accrued liability, UAL, I believe is, is the term. Um, so they're, like you mentioned, though, you've got a number that you have to fund over time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they're probably 20 percent of the way there. Um, so, and again, that's a lot better than most municipalities in the Commonwealth better than uh, a lot of other school systems. So there's there's a range. Um, we've got creating other individuals on the outside team that you're looking for actual specific funding levels. Yeah. We, we can get you a better answer that way. Um, but it really depends upon the community. What you know, it, it, it's I can't give you a grade right now. Oh no. But we can we can yeah. let you know. Yeah. All um, right. One other quick thing to Jason's point about the level of risk you take and and um, being conservative enough because of public dollars and being aggressive enough because of long-term liability. These are public funds. So you, it's really tough to say to member communities, we'd like $50,000, $100,000 when the markets go down and now that $100,000 is worth $75,000. Okay, and and ask for more money. So um, it, it's a very um, fine line that you're telling, I think starting right in the middle makes perfect sense. Uh, what we find is a number of communities over time, as they get more comfortable and has to, as they have earnings in the portfolio, and they still have 20, 25 years to go, um, they will up the risk as they get more comfortable. Our job is to help you do that. And again, it's looking at it as, are you a 60-year-old looking for retirement or are you a 30-year-old looking for retirement? You take the level of risk based upon how soon you need these dollars. I'm more than happy to help you to discuss the pros and cons of different risk levels. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I see a hand raised behind us. Uh, Leslie Ann McGee is here tonight. She just won election to take Mark's spot. So, Mark, do you want to slide over? No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 no. Don't forget uh, so Leslie Ann hey, is, uh, hey, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the director of the Marine Robotics Lab at Woods Hole. I think she's going to have uh, some great contributions uh, to our board in the future. Um, but she had a question, so oh, I'll thanks. recognize you. I'm here just to observe, but since this is coming to me next, I think, I yeah. figured I'd ask a question. So I'm just curious, so um, I'm just learning, so bear with me, but um, so you all currently operate under the current SEC rules where you have to provide a fiduciary responsibility and you're advising, correct? It's very likely that those rules will be changing under this current administration back to just a suitability advising, yeah. but from what I understand that many firms may stick with the fiduciary approach so I'm sort of wondering where you all from a strategic perspective fall out of that. Are you going to still provide fiduciary guidance or are you going to go back to suitability guidance? On the fee-based accounts that we manage, uh, we've all always followed a, um, a mandate that, that pretty much mirrors the fiduciary standard. So if anything, um, we have nothing to go back to. Um, we've always been fiduciary standard on these dollars. It's fee-based on the positions that, that I um, put in here, you'll see that it's all institutional share classes. There are no front-end loads, there are no back-end loads, there are no 12B1 fees. Um, they're the cheapest sheep share class available to us. Um, we don't have incentives to sell any particular funds because we are in trips or anything else. I was at Bear Stearns years ago, early morning phone calls, squawk box, where everyone said, okay, we're going to sell home people to every single one of our clients today. Not the way we operate. Um, so, fiduciary standard is something that um, there's pros and cons to it, so I, I can't 
unequivocally say it's the best thing out there. Um, but in terms of how we make money from a fiduciary standard, that's how we do it. It's always what's best for the client, not what's best for us. Thanks. Any other questions from the committee? One final question. <coughs> there were some rumors that Gaskey was going to update and change to mandate OPEB contributions from municipalities, but I haven't heard that echo in about 18 months. Is, is that off the tables, or have you heard any rumors of that as well? Not, it's not right now, that's what we have. We haven't heard. No, okay. So you're, you're getting this. Well, and it's definitely something that was we're aware we'll make sure that you're aware as well. Great. So. Biggest thing is, is, is the statement that the previous individual noted about the fact that you're starting to show your gas reliability on main financial papers now, not just as a footnote. Uh, that's the biggest change we've seen. And again, that will make a number of entities communities say, okay, we've got to start taking care of this. But in terms of the, um, taking one step further, I haven't seen that yet. Okay. Great, thank you very much. I just wanted to bring that back to light, that when we started this, I believe we're on to our third contribution as of this yeah. budget coming up. Um, we really took a step in the right direction to get our foot into the pool uh, to test the waters. Um, but pretty soon, it could be something that's mandated. And again, it's gonna impact our financial statements from the auditing perspective. Uh, the more we put in, the less it's gonna count against us. So. Thank you, everybody who supported that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention that the information that we share that does include our third payment, the payment for this year. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, I think we have um, Mark the uh, smaller. Yeah, I'd like to move out of order just uh, for our gentleman to move on. He made an effort to be here, he's been out of town. There's a presentation that uh, he sent over this afternoon that uh, I didn't have a chance to read either, but um, I think it says your packet. Does everybody yes, have one of these, Joy? Yes, I do. Okay, so we'll move to, to take the SFFR out of uh, order. We need a motion to vote. It's, 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 it's in there. If you weren't at the SFFR. Yeah, like, I got two copies. What's needed in the packet? Was it the, uh, the, the outline? Yes, the outline and the PowerPoint. My apologies, Mr. Chairman. I made a motion. Yes. Yes. I second, second the motion. All those in favor? No, I, uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Against? Sorry. Thank you, back, Mark. So, I think there's been a lot of thought that's gone on um, over the last maybe 18 months about this. So, I guess the idea of me coming today was to give you kind of a high over, high level overview of the solar market in mass. I'll tell you about our company a little bit. And then say what I think of the potential project that could be right outside these doors. So that was kind of the goal. Um, I just look out No, thank you. It's nice that our school principals do everything. Yeah. Jim, I'd like to give you an AV specialist. Ooh, like a -V yeah. <laughs> it's quite a skill set. I'm just going to pull it back so you guys can see a little bit better. We're good. No? You're going to pull a cord out, Jim. Be careful, buddy. <laughs> we have copies of it anyways. <laughs> so don't, don't worry. Don't break your back there. <laughs> yeah. You do this and you have solar on your house. I do. I have solar. I support the solar initiative. So the only one that doesn't have is me. So as long as I can <laughs> hit the button and reference it a few times, we should be in good shape. You want more like yeah, so I don't kill Yeah, you know what? That might be the no no if you guys have a full Christine. Yeah, this, this one? Christine. Here. Christine. Do you care? I didn't sign. Do you care? Yeah. I'll come over and sign. Sure. All right. All right, so the, the next slide from here just has some, you know, some kind of high level numbers of operating. I just mentioned uh, some of these next ones that will be up on the next slide, please. 
All right, so um, the solar market in general, if you look at the United States, Massachusetts is one of the top five states in the nation, which is hard to believe. We're in New England, we're a small state, it's not that sunny. Uh, but the incentives are incredibly strong here, put out by the Department of Energy Resources. So even though we have two offices in California, our revenue that we do with our single office in Massachusetts um, is by far the, the largest in the company. So we're probably about a $350 million company, and probably anywhere from 100 to 200 million of that comes from the state of Massachusetts each year. You'd think California is where all the deals were getting done, but the Massachusetts incentives are quite strong. Uh, so I will be anywhere in the state from walking in the woods in uh, central and western Mass, evaluating land to up on rooftops, parking lots, and all that. It's kind of a mixture of, of different, um, different projects. We can go ahead and hop to the next slide. So basically, we work in the public sector, um, the tech sector, retail, industrial, agriculture, um, and for utility steel projects. These are some of our customers. I'm not going to read all of them, just so you can see who we work with. And basically, we take an approach to these projects where you have to start by developing, and you work through what we call the ETC section, the engineering. I guess the procuring is not up there into construction. Um, and then one of the biggest challenges to financing these projects are actually doing just that, financing these projects. They're incredibly expensive. They need to be subsidized by the state and the government in order to have someone that wants to build them. So of our 400 megawatts that we've installed as a company, we've never failed to finance a project. So that's a big thing that just talks about our history um, across the country. So then we also have an operations and maintenance, maintenance division. Um, but I guess the point I'm trying to make with this slide is there's a lot of development. There's quite a few developers out there that try to kind of bake a project up through the town, permitting, through the interconnection, um, kind of grab a piece of the land, and they go to market with it. They, they take that, that development asset and they want to flip it to another group. And actually, um, from some talks with Joy, I learned that the project that you all are off-takers on from a handful of years ago um, in Dartmouth, not, is it Dartmouth? Gotcha. Yeah, okay. So I heard that that project, I think it was flipped three or four times before it was actually installed. So that's kind of the market standard, I would say. It's here we've got this asset, it's going to perform for 10 to 20 to 30 years, and then it's taken to market and exchanged its hands quite a few times. What that does, it drags out the process of the project actually getting installed, and then that power being able to be used um, for whoever the off taker is, whether it's you or someone on site or whatever it may be. So Borrego's approach is to basically kind of develop the project ourselves, um, construct it, bring financing in. We will sell the project, but a condition of our contract as we sell the project is to build it ourselves and to remain on as, as the operations and maintenance provider. So as you work your way through all those steps, our approach is to be there every step of the way, um, as opposed to just develop an asset and then sell it on the street. So you can then on to the next one. Um, talking about most of this, the, these groups on the right side, that's who owns these projects. There's a lot of uh, skepticism, you might say, in the market. Well, who do you sell it to? Is it, you know, no offense to anyone from Texas, that brother lives there, so I can say this. It's not a cowboy in Texas who's in the oil business who wants to dabble in energy in New England. It's, you know, reputable big companies like this, um, independent power producers, banks, and that's basically who ends up owning the project as opposed to a small you know, finance group on uh, Beacon Street, or, or excuse me, Newberry Street, so I meant to say it was Street or something like that. So these are kind of our partners that we secure financing for. And then I just threw a couple slides to show you guys a couple of these bigger projects that we've done. You can flip through these pretty quick the next two or three but This actually, I bet you everyone has seen this one. This is right off the Mass Pike in Warren. There's a little golf course out there. And we did three or four projects together that made up about 12 megawatts. So I'm sure everybody's seen that on your left as you're heading west. With and that's on top of the track at Harvard University. <clears throat> and for your project, you know, what's a carport? Some people don't know. This is what they look like. They're essentially about 13 feet high. They have lighting underneath. They basically provide covered parking um, and allow for a dual use of the space. Um, you won't lose parking spots. Your configuration may change a little bit from how it is, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. One of the challenges with the parking areas here is that they're all circular. And the way you have to build these is with a whole lot of right angles, right? We haven't come up with, uh, with uh, round shaped solar panels just yet. Anyways, just, I just want everyone to see what we're going to kind of dive into here as we start talking a little bit more. 
So the Massachusetts SMART program, this is, this is the state incentive program that we have available right now. Um, we are finishing up with the SREC 2 program. Um, prior to that, it was SREC 1. The mass market opened in 2007 or so, and it's been a really, really strong market ever since. We've been kind of, anyone who knows anything about solar has known that we've kind of, in Massachusetts, those that we've been stuck in between two programs for the last 12, 13, 14, 18 months, something like that. Um, we haven't been stuck because we're still building projects, but we're finishing up a project where the incentive is constantly stepping down over time, and we're entering into a new project, a new program, where once again, it'll be set up, we call this a declining block program. So in block one all the way on the left, the first projects that get into this next program that opens up, which will open at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall, those are gonna be the projects that receive the, the highest subsidy from the state, which is gonna make them worth most, which relates directly back to you all for how a developer like me can come and try and basically set up a set up a project on site. So the point I'm trying to make, it doesn't this graph actually kind of frustrates me because it still looks like a pretty darn good incentive in block eight, um, but it's really not. By the time you get out of the first couple blocks of this next program, um, when you take into account the current tariffs, um, if anyone's followed uh, what the current administration has done with that, whether it's steel, um, importing steel and importing solar modules are two recent tariffs that for the next three, four, five years are gonna have pretty big impact on the solar industry. So as we get out into the back half of this program, it's gonna be harder and harder to actually get projects that, you know, we say pencil in our, in our industry. So as that incentive steps down, the cost of solar should be stepping down with it as the market grows, but we get curveballs thrown at us every once in a while where, you know, maybe the cost of racking and inverters or whatever it may be drops down, but if we have this hurdle to deal with with uh, our modules and our steel, which especially on a carport structure would be a big part of the cost. The point I'm trying to make is, as we get later into this area here, the projects will become less and less attractive. So, you know, it's the old sales pitch, or, you know, go as fast as you can, but this just kind of illustrates that, which I want you guys to see. So, here's your site. I was working in Microsoft Paint. Anyone else use Microsoft Paint? It's like the easiest, uh, less sophisticated program on your computer. But basically, these are kind of the areas. These are the areas that I've basically identified as spots where we could consider putting um, putting these carport structures. You know, you see the two thin ones on the side of the baseball field and the track. Those are kind of interesting spots. It looks like people are parking there. And my whole goal was to be able to put some kilowatts down here and in order to do that, make that long run with the interconnection to, inter to tie the system all together. Those kind of look like two spots where we can add a little bit more size and keep everything a little bit more connected. So it might not be a bad uh, bad thing to have a little bit of covered parking on the side of the fields where you know you stand underneath. But that's my idea there for where we can look to develop here. Um, and then on the next slide. Actually, before you go, sure, you yeah, please, just interrupt go back to that slide. So um, down towards the bottom, you have that straight line along the baseball field. Yep. I know from past experience, there are baseballs that <laughs> come yes. backwards and over. So if they hit a panel, is that how's, yeah, so how's the, the panel? panel has, it, it's enclosed in almost like a, we're talking about sports here, almost like a plexiglass cover. Um, it's a question mark, though. I've never put one that close to a baseball field, but. You know. Well, generally they're going to go up, and if, it, if it's going to hit from where that is, it comes down. Yeah, it comes straight down. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Physics, Physics 101. Yeah. He's an um, engineer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I kind of drew this, like it looks a little silly, but I think you see the shapes of the parking lots. Um, are, are not, there, there's no red angles there, there's just a couple on each one, um, which is not typical, I hardly ever see that, um, but I see it here. I you. So there's a few things that we could maybe do here, like, you know, there's that group of trees in between the two groups of uh, the two sections up top, we could, you know, we could maybe re do some reconfiguring. I'm not proposing any of that now, but as I just see some of the um, constraints in the site, that's something that obviously jumps off the page. And then if you look at the top left corner, which would be the northwest corner, um, right off Pembroke Street, um, that could be a great parking lot, too. Yep. Yes. <laughs> really, yes. That's yeah. a bad idea. Yeah. Where is that? That's the Lake Street lot. That's, that's, that's the teacher lot. Lake Street. <laughs> oh, 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 I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't want to shovel snow off at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, 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 the detention basin for the drainage, 
Yes, it's, right here. I was blown to see how deep that was. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's still still got sun all the time and no trees. Yeah. Yeah. You do need to have so there's ground mounted solar and then there's this type of solar, um, which is a carport. Um, permitting a ground mounted solar project in an area that's wet um, generally is not feasible. Just um, Wetlands Protection Act and what rules the town might have. Um, when we're on a paved surface, it's actually, I don't want to use the word easy, but it, it's pretty easy compared to when you're out there in the woods trying to permit a, a project and all that. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so what the heck is a megawatt? A megawatt is 1,000 kilowatts. So as we focus on this area up here, the middle school, the upper school parking lot, we'll call it and refer to them properly, you can fit just over a megawatt there. Um, you can go ahead and hop to the next one. <laughs> the, uh, the tennis courts almost look like um, they're, they're covered, but that's just the color of your tennis courts. Um, so then you've got the, the handful of other sections um, that are shown there as well. And that's 858 kilowatts. So you put that together, basically just under 2 megawatts, roughly 1.9. Um, system size is really a hard thing to talk about in this business. Um, because we may or may not be able to reconfigure some parking lots. We may or may not be able to put that strip right next to the baseball or the uh, backfield there. Um, so I guess I put the money, the dollars up here because I know that's what everybody's really interested in. So I want everyone to take a minute to look at that and then I'll kind of explain through it. Um, but everything's based off two things, system size and then a lease rate per year um, on a per megawatt basis. Yes, question. Why is the range so wide? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So not every project is created equal at all. There are certain areas, um, take for example, Eversource versus National Grid. Um, the incentives in the Eversource territory are a lot greater than they are on National Grid. It's also much harder to develop in Eversource. If you think about where Eversource is, it's, it's surrounding Boston, um, highly populated areas. National Grid is once you get outside of 95 and you start to get out into the open open area, it's very, I don't want to say easy, I keep using that word. Um, it's a lot easier to, to acquire land out west just because of the space. Um, so Eversource has higher rates to incentivize projects that can, that can um, move forward down here. We need extra dollars to be able to um, come down here and do a project. So, System size 1.9 megawatts, you can own it. It costs about six or seven million dollars to install it. Um, the way Massachusetts is set up, um, compared to in the past with these programs, every project that you had, you had to account for where every kilowatt hour was going to go. So on, your, on the prior project, there's an allotment of kilowatt hours that you all are purchasing. Um, there's probably some other off takers on that project, and literally every kilowatt hour needs to be accounted for. That creates a nightmare for the utility, a nightmare for the Department of Energy Resources, and basically everybody who is going to sign one of those contracts has heard from us about a solar project you know, for years. So it's become very challenging. So this new program is called the feed-in tariff, and every kilowatt hour that's produced, you can send it directly to the grid, and it essentially becomes a power plant. And the, the utility that you're interconnecting with will give you a fixed rate um, per kilowatt hour, guaranteed for 20 years. So that's what the programs look like now. Once you send that electricity, you can either be compensated for it, or I can either be compensated for it, or I can receive a, an on-bill crediting, um, an on-bill credit, which is different than net metering. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but basically, then I can take those credits and I can sell them to folks. If I do that, the only thing it does is it actually takes away from the incentive that's that's already there. <coughs> this is this is a complicated very long section of the, um, the new SPARC program. But essentially, that's not the game anymore. Instead of selling all the power, it makes more sense to just sell it all back. What we can do is we can sell some of the power to the sites that we're on in an effort to kind of sweep the deal a little bit, allow you to become part of the, you know, the green energy offtake as opposed to just hosting it. Brings a few more dollars of revenue, but that's not really where the meaningful revenue is coming from in these projects anymore. Where it used to be the, the, the whole key to you would, you would sign a power purchase agreement with Silver Lake School District, and you could count on that revenue coming in, and then there was also an incentive, and you kind of stack them together, and that's what the revenue was with these projects. Now it makes sense to, set, to send it all to the grid, but there's some extra value for the host. So basically, 
buy kilowatt hours at about a penny discount um, for each one. So it's not it's not as significant as it's been, but you know it's still green energy that we can sell you through a power purchase agreement um, with you as an off taker. The site lease is really how <coughs> the majority of the dollars um, can get passed to the host. And this range of twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars, that depends on, you know, I mentioned a minute ago the, the territory that you're in, and then also interconnection. Interconnection is becoming an extremely difficult um, task for any developer. I mentioned all those projects that we're doing here. If you just go on Google Earth and take a look around, you'll see solar projects everywhere now, whether it's on the roof or on the ground. There's so many projects that it's actually incredibly expensive to interconnect, um, and the timeline to do it can sometimes take 24 months. It actually can take a lot longer than that. We're really expecting from the time we, we, we start working on a site for it to take a couple of years for us to be able to start constructing on that site. And that's simply from, number one, the utilities overwhelmed with the amount of um, applications they're getting because it's a really strong market. <clears throat> and number two, you reach saturation points. And as you start reaching saturation points, um, there are certain thresholds that you can, sometimes you can't cross before basically, you know, the, uh, the substation gets cooked for a, 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 you know, lack of a better term. So that lease rate is going to depend on where you are, and I'll kind of get into your, um, what I see for you guys, but basically that's kind of what, what I think is a good representation of the market. Every developer is going to have a different view of an area. They'll have, some will have more or less intimate knowledge of projects that are going on in that area. But that's what I think you'll, you can expect to see. Um, your project, we can talk to the next slide. Actually, no, we can go back one. Your project, if I were to make an offer on it right now, and if we were in a position to get started on it, I would be at the top of that range. But really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look ahead, you know, six, maybe six months from now, if an RFP or an RFQ is issued, the program is, has launched, we're, you know, getting a little bit further into the SMART program. Um, these are still blocked, you know, one, two, three, four numbers, but I think that's probably where we, where this project ends up. Sure. Just a quick, the six to million, seven million dollar capital purchase to own it. Mm -hmm. Does that include the site prep? So for it to be able to reconfigure. No, so right, site so there's prep, another. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't get into that yet. But so a site, if we wanted to reconfigure parking lots, we'd have higher site prep costs. The system would get bigger, but the lease rate would probably come down a little. But I bet you you'd make out a handy with a bigger system that might be a slightly lower yeah. lease rate. Um, so these numbers are based on no reconfiguration? Yeah, this is based on that uh, design that I showed there, which is kind of where what we have available today. Okay, the leases last for 20 years, and you know, just about every lease I offer would have a 2% annual escalation, so it does grow over time. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we get it for back after the 20 year contract. Um, it's, it, it makes quite a difference. Okay, we'll keep on. Um, so how does a project like this become a reality? Um, you know, as soon as possible, you know, internally I, I try to get to a go or no-go moment where you either want to pursue a project or you don't. And then it's in the best interest to as quickly as you possibly can launch an RFP or an RFQ um, to get started with that process. As, yes? When do we lock in the block? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So in order to lock in the block, um, I've got to do a couple things. I have to have site control. I have to apply and receive my interconnection services agreement with the utility, which, if I'm lucky, takes 85 business days, um, maybe more like 120. Um, and then the last thing I have to do is I have to receive all my uh, all my permits in town. So once I have that package, I can then go apply and qualify for SMART. Do those blocks revolve around the state's fiscal year? Nope, it's a first come, first serve um, basis. So each block has about 80 megawatts in it. So as soon as there's 80 megawatts, we can pop to the next one. So in National Grid, before the program opens, we're expecting to be in block five, six, seven. Whenever source opens, we're going to be in block one for a while. Um, back to my point about how it's, it's difficult down here. You could, you know, you could fill up a couple blocks with just 15 or 20 projects out west. Um, and then selecting a developer that's committed um, to an accelerated development cycle. You know, we talked about site discovery, or we talked about, um, you know, acquiring the land or just basically having site control. What a lot of developers do is they try and establish site control first, and then they'll start on their site discovery. They'll order, you know, you have to do an environmental assessment, you have to do um, anyone who's permitted uh, or been involved with that. I know there's quite a bit. Uh, wildlife studies, 
Um, and the wetlands, even though we're going to be in a parking lot, we'll have to study the wetlands in the surrounding area. So what we do, and, and the interconnection process as well, so you need someone that's going to start all three of these things at the exact same time immediately in an effort to get into that earlier block of smart. So that's just you know one of the one of the keys to getting you in the early block. So this is just kind of I'm not gonna I don't know if I'll read through each one of these, but this is kind of our process. Um, if we want to do a project and we and we do win the bid, we start with a letter of intent, and then I immediately have a budget to start on all that stuff um, and start seeing what the project really looks like. We'll work for our lease and option agreement. Once we sign that, we're basically ready to, to start permitting in the town. We'll continue spending money with the utility um, and on the project. Uh, and just that's that quick timeline there. Eventually, the utility comes back to you and says, OK, you have permission to interconnect, and then they give you a timeline. Um, like I said, two years. You know, Sometimes it can be a little bit quicker than that, but it's, it, it's a long haul. It's not a quick process. Um, so my opinion of your project, you're in the right location down here at Eversource, so you have higher, um, you have higher incentives. Uh, the site, the site's a really good site. I mean, I, I made some jokes about the, you know, the, the shape of the parking lots, but there, there's enough space to have a meaningful size project, which is great. As you get down to maybe a megawatt, um, all you need is one little thing to potentially go wrong, and then all of a sudden the project, um, you know, the project struggles to advance. Interconnection profile, there's very few projects down here. There's a couple locally, but I think you're in a really good spot as far as interconnection goes. Um, so I would rate that as strong. Permanent profile, we're not trying to develop in a wet area, you know, down in a, in a drainage swale or anything like that. So your permanent profile is strong. Um, one of the challenges is that you're a public entity and you have to go to an RFQ or an RFP, so that's just that's going to take time. That's not a quick process um, in the declining block program. Another, you know, potential challenge I touched on it earlier is the system's really spread out. You know, we like when everything's right in the same area. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge. That's something that kind of will affect, um, will drive the build cost up. We've got to basically make it together. Um, the configuration of the parking lot, just something to think about for later. Um, and then there is some potential upside here. Um, the new program has an incentive for battery storage. So literally some of these projects are going to have, um, you know, it looks like a, a storage container, you know, 15 by 40 feet, <laughs> full of batteries, um, literally full of batteries with a couple computers in there that are operated, you know, by a computer in an office somewhere, and basically what it will do is it will it'll grab the electricity and then it will just kind of control the way that we deploy it. We'll deploy it at certain times of, day, of the day um, where there could be a little bit of a boost in the incentive. So that's something we share with the site host as we as we got into this. My my thought is by the time if you do want to move forward with the project, by the time you get there, um, we'll be pretty darn close to the program and we'll have some more clarity on this battery storage. Um, it's it's a it's a super good technology. Tesla cars are totally changing the world and like everybody's kind of catching on with that technology. Um, so I I definitely think it's a good project. You know, I put that lease rate um, range. If I were to make the offer right now, I'd be at the very top of that range, maybe a little bit higher, to try and get the project going right now because I, I think it's a very strong project. Um, so that's you know kind of my opinion. It might be the last one. What to watch out for? Speculative Massachusetts developers. We have such a strong market that you'll hear you know development you know real estate developers in Colorado might open a shop with two people in Massachusetts to try to develop a project or two. Um, because they heard it's a really good market. So there's a lot of that going on in an effort to flip these projects. Um, so whoever you pick, whether it's Brago or anyone else, you know, how many projects have they actually built in Massachusetts is so key. Massachusetts is one of the toughest places to develop. Um, our towns are very, very difficult to get permits in. So if you've never been there before and you've never presented a solar project, you're not going to get one. Um, so that's just something to watch out for. Recommendations, you know, I mentioned this act quickly. How's the roof? I know we, we had some preliminary talks about the roof, but rooftop project, projects are very strong. You could definitely, I'd say you could maybe fit another 500 kilowatts up there, maybe more. Um, developer selection process. I think an RFQ, um, request for qualification or request for quote would be the right move here instead of an RFP. Um, and from there, make your short lists and then pick your developer by making an award. Um, RFPs are really challenging because when I receive one, I, I, it's, even if you put together a 50-page RFP, it's really hard for me to understand what's important to you. 
Um, and like things like reconfiguring parking lots pop in my head when I see it to try and bring extra value to it. I have no idea if you guys may or may not be interested in something like that. And that's just an example. But um, I, I would definitely recommend an RFQ so you can bring in the, the top developers that you think have the best track record, sit down with them, <coughs> get their opinion of your project, and whoever you feel most comfortable with, I would select that way. I know RFPs are not all about price. In fact, a lot of them there's you know submissions with and without price, but um, the most successful ones I've seen have been through RFQ. And I, I'd say that even if we didn't, even if on the ones we don't win. Can I ask you a question? Yes. How do you know what our RFQ or our, where, do we, where is that starting point? Yeah, so um, we've done some projects uh, with public, public schools, so I mentioned you know, on our call, I would you recommend them. touching these with them. We did yeah. to them. Oh, you did, okay. Yep. So most, um, just about every RFQ that goes out, they bring on kind of a, a specialist who understands the market a little bit, understand solar, um, and they'll help you craft the RFP. Um, but it still ends up being a very challenging document for me to try and get in your minds and understand what, what you'd like to see. Um, and, and, and some, you know, some, some folks are, are happy with, with upside potential of what the project might be able to get down the road, and there's ways to share in revenues that way. And others are, you know, just like the last folks who said, are very conservative and just want the guaranteed numbers of, of what they know can come in. So there's kind of a balance to that. Um, you know, in, in like energy storage, I mean, I could propose a project with energy storage, but you might lose a couple parking spots. I don't know what's more important, you know, probably the parking spots. <laughs> but for us, it's quite an investment of time and resources to. Yeah. Just get an RFQ out the door. Yeah, yeah, it's not an easy process. I understand. That. So um, Christine and I spoke with Josh with Caradiglo, um, and we sent you the notes of the um, of the conversation. Josh was was very helpful, um, and then he suggested we contact Plymouth, which we did, and we had a conversation with their business manager. And then Christine also spoke with the person who wrote their um, the consultant. The yes. consultant that they used. I wondered if, if if you wanted to just take a minute and explain the difference between an RFQ and an RFP, because sure. I'm not sure everyone knows <clears throat> Yeah, sure. Is. Sorry about that. I see them a lot, so I, I kind of blew through that. But an RFP is a request for a proposal, and it's basically, show, give me your best and final, and then we will we'll make a selection from that. An RFQ is either a request for a quote, which is kind of an exploratory number, where when I see an RFQ, I tend to give two or three different options of what we might be able to use. Here's the biggest system. Here's what I think is a realistic system. Here's a system if you don't want to, you know, use the, the small parking areas along the, um, along some of the fields. So the RFQ selection process, you, you kind of shortlist from either one, and then you bring in your top your top choices. Um, but if the price is, the, the, the price becomes less important um, in the RFQ, and it's more about who you feel comfortable with, and then we can have talks about things like this, and you know, you'll you'll really get to know, you know, how many projects have been built. Um, I'm not kidding you, there's a lot of developers who put pictures up of other people's projects on their websites and include them in there. It's a really, really strong market and like there's people that are um, that either don't understand it or misrepresent themselves um, and they, they throw out these, these, these outliers, right? These numbers that look too good to be true. They usually are, sometimes they work out. Um, but essentially it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of more of a screening process as opposed to picking that way. Um, the big line I use is, is uh, you know, to have a guaranteed revenue source of a project that gets built is, is, is far better than a much higher revenue pro, um, projection of a project that can't get built, or a project that's just going to get flipped. And as you get further into that block, um, into the declining block, what ultimately happens is at some point the project doesn't quite make sense, and even though you made an award to someone two or three developers ago, they're going to say, hey, we're, we're finally the guys that are going to build it, and maybe they are, and they're going to say, but, the economics have changed over the last two years, and I have to take your lease rate and cut it in half or the deal doesn't work. So that's that's kind of what happens. Um, people don't realize how much time it takes to get to reserve your qualification into these incentive programs. Um, so that's that's kind of just part of the recommendation. That's the worst thing that could happen is that the project gets pushed out, you've invested time to, to do one of those proposals, and then all of a sudden it's six or twelve months after you've made an award and you know. It hasn't qualified for the program yet, and the project's kind of taken to the street and, and sold once again. So I, I have a question. I, I have four kids, two who drive and two who do, do not yet. Okay. Um, the two who drive have set a really bad precedent. They both totaled vehicles completely. <laughs> um, I guess, yeah. So um, parking lot in a high school. Yep. <laughs> um, what could go wrong? Um, <laughs> 
what happens if somebody hits one of these poles and there is damage to, I mean, is it, is it, how's the insurance? Yeah, so, so both parties will have to have an insurance policy. Um, and it's, it's, it becomes, it's not technically a fixture, but it would be no different than if one of them, you know, drove through the front doors of your, of your school. They, they'd be responsible for that. Um, <laughs> But as far as, um, you know, so these systems, I think we're, so if this, this is, let's say there was a car accident, and um, I actually don't know the answer to this scenario, but I'm going to throw it out there anyways. If there's a car accident, the system can't operate any longer. Um, I'm actually not sure. Um, this is kind of a newer market. Uh, carports in Massachusetts, the incentives are really stepped up for this new program. So we've only built a couple here. We've built hundreds of them on the West Coast, but we're just getting started now that they're there. I don't know exactly how that would go. Generally, rent can... Um, in our contracts, rent is only abated um, through an act of God, force majeure, or through complete system loss due to casualty. Um, how casualty is defined in underneath one of these things, I bet you it is something that's going to evolve a little bit. Um, but you screwed. If you take something pretty major into that system, that happens. You're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mark. So Josh, we, we've been looking at this for a while, and, and I'm probably the one that kicked the can and, and tried to, to do this. Kingston is a green community, so mm -hmm. they are very um, you know, excited about green initiatives, and, and that there are some incentives, I think, that, that are enhanced by that. But um, also, uh, we have an education, and we are exposing this to our student body. And um, having the kids participate, the students participate in how it's generating electricity, what time, the battery storage, why the battery is there to provide. And I think the educational value and having them come to school and hopefully miss the poll, but at least notice that, yeah. hey, we're part of a green community and we're generating yeah. electricity um, here in our parking lot. Yeah, you know, solar gets caught up a lot of times in, some people love it, some people think it's really, really ugly development. Um, and you, you see it as a structure, but to your point, it's. There's a reason there's strong incentives here. It's, it's pretty necessary for for our whole future. So our whole we, future. the two um, issues that we started yeah. were aesthetics, and the second part was snow removal. Yeah. And I noticed your 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 canopies don't have a gap in the middle to let the snow fall. Yeah. Which yeah. So know. there's a couple different designs of canopies, but all of them have either either a lack of gap in the middle or they have a lip on the edge. So it's very similar to a roof where that snow will stay up there, it'll start to melt, and it'll work its way down. Our production models understand that it snows up here, so we know in you know January, February, March, we're not the production is not going to be there. But we're aware of that, and our projects reflect that. For the but the solar panels I have in my house, the snow slides off of them yep. more yep. effectively, and I don't have roof damps. I mean, it's an enhancement to my roof issue. So you would think you'd want to have a gap in the middle so the snow would fall between oh, the Oh, I thought you were going the other way. With that. No, I, I'm, no, I'm got serious. It, got it. Yeah. So uh, you know, our, our custodial staff was concerned about how they would clear the snow, but if the snow that obviously doesn't fall under the panels, anything yep. coming pretty much straight down, they'd have less snow to remove. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to more. Yeah, would. And these are they're designed high enough so that you can, you know, you can bring all emergency access vehicles under them, so snow plows and things like that can get in right. and out of the fine. Mm -hmm. There's definitely gonna be some areas where you need to get out of the truck and, and pull the shovel out for sure. And I have heard that the landscaping trees in in our stone islands are not anybody's favorite thing. I heard that beautiful. Too. I did. So, I so if those that. had to come down, I think <laughs> most of the school would fly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's basically, the pines might be a different so, story. Though. I think there are advantages and disadvantages to RFQs versus RFPs. I write a lot of them and I review okay. a lot of the responses from them in yep. my work, and there are pros and cons each way. The nice thing about an RFP is that we tell you our goals and you give us some solutions, mm -hmm. and then you price them out for us, even if it's more than one solution. Yeah. Low, medium, high, big, little, small, whatever. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions I had for you about Kingston and going off of um, the last question was we, we are a green community. We have been trying to develop solar wind farm, solar farm on our landfill. Mm -hmm. We've been through three RFPs. We have not been successful um, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> um, but um, you do land-based solar. So one is, if, did you, have you ever applied for RFP? And if so, why not? I mean, if not... For your, for your RFP? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I haven't seen that one. Um, it's been out three times over the last four right. years. Nobody bid on it because it was unbuildable. It's, 
what we had. What so landfills are really challenging. I mean, there's I've been to quite a few landfills and decided not to respond due to the challenges of the site, um, or sometimes the goals for. Believe me, I know I just built a dog park on top of a landfill, and there were a lot of challenges. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, you can't penetrate the ground. Um, you have to import materials. You have to have access roads. It becomes pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, but. Um, so I'm sorry, what, what was the... And this one has a wind turbine in the middle of it. Yeah. So oh, throw ice at it, at your panels. So if you were to develop this site, could you get it done in a way that there it didn't impact student activities? I mean, like, how long would the actual construction yeah, be? Yeah, construction. So, yeah, I think I, meant, I had somewhere up there that construction was kind of a question mark. So when you reserve your incentive, you have basically 12 to 18 months to actually build it. Yeah. So there's, there's some time to coordinate construction. Um, I think going into this one, knowing that it's a school, the construction has to be done in the summertime. Um, summertime is how long? Less long Eight less weeks. Than months. <laughs> yeah. Less than two months. Yeah. So generally, these projects take, you know, once we put a shovel on the ground, they generally take three to four months, depending on the size of the project and the location. Um, you got to get pretty creative with a tight schedule like that. You could, we could pull it off, but it's one of those things where if, if you receive your incentive um, in May. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to build it next summer, not this summer. But we'll know we have our block position. So that could drive some people a little bit crazy where it's like, ah, we don't get lease revenue for another year. But that, that definitely that definitely does happen. But we could pull it off in the summertime and have to do some pretty careful um, yes. staging and planning. So can you build one section at a time and not all of it at once? Yeah, we can kind of work our way across for sure. I mean, the way that that layout was there, there's definitely three or four. Um, you know, you can take care of the teacher friends over there first. first absolutely. Yeah. Well, you'd be the first yeah. to lose your parking. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Nobody. Oh, yeah. 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 I um, <laughs> uh, school committee convention. I um, was exposed to a company. They had um, things on solar installations at schools, but they had uh, also an educational component to bring you to the school. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Mark, I didn't quite answer that for you. We, we would absolutely do that. I mean, we have, um, we're a pretty good company. We have 275 employees across our offices. We have a very full marketing department. Um, we would, we'd love to have some sort of, you know, not just a ribbon cutting, but, you know, some sort of an educational piece to it. I mean, um, is, there, it's, is there some a component where you could bring, like, the kids into like an introduction of the technology of like, absolutely you know, like 100 percent i probably wouldn't be the guy who did it but um, <laughs> i'm I just asking there, but there's someone who will be much better at that than I all right um <laughs> is there any way that actually we could get something for the school here for kids to just be able to take a look at it do you, yeah you um, know what they have in our office we have quite a few tables that are made up of solar panels you know yeah. they're they're closed in that's kind of a cool thing um yeah. the setup you could have you could do that, and then you could have a uh, monitor set up that kind of just shows the production, mm -hmm. um, you know, almost like a kiosk type yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. So we go right into this. Into the school, and then a curriculum-based, uh, I mean, our tech uh, teachers could be uh, provided with curriculum uh, that would yeah. work and focus on it um, that they could share with the students. Absolutely. That'd be great. And to be honest, I'm, I'm thinking, like, we have a CTE program here, and I was thinking, down the line, could we get it that we would have kids that are entry level technicians yeah. in the program? So yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's I'm a jumping ahead here down the teachers. road, but. No, you're really not, actually. I mean, yeah. there's, I mean, you are for this project. Right. That's already happened in Massachusetts, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I, I have a job in solar in Massachusetts, and right. that job didn't exist when I was in high school. Yeah. Right? You have questions? Yes. Sorry. I had chatted and worked with Mark a little bit when we were investigating some of the solar a couple of years back, so we know how difficult it is. But just a quick thought, rather than going down to that JPL, would it benefit the interconnectedness to include the roof and then the parking lots and basically have the project run from the Lake Street lot, which was the nice one, the one that we liked, <laughs> all, the way, all the way over to the junior high roof and that oh, would kind of, the north. because it would, would that cut down, It would it increase like the project size, but then yeah. cut down on costs by making it a little bit more interconnected. Yeah. Everything so close, that, the closer we work together, um, definitely would make the project um, cheaper to construct, and that can that can drive up. Mm -hmm. Any state like, grants that would help us redo the roof before we put the <laughs> yes. on it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and that's our problem. That we we have some question. issues with our roof. Yeah. 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 So the other issue is if we do have a roof problem, then we can't go on the roof. Yeah. yeah. But, but, I mean, like down the road, if we need to do some repair, we take we have to remove the panels and then do so the repair. So it, it, even though your roof has problems, it's worth looking at because there's there's ways to set it up where we can no, take the, the lease revenue that would be paid to you over 20 years, and we can pull a bunch of it up, 
at a discounted rate um, and, and hand that over and, and basically you can repair your roof with it. Um, there you go. I, I really would need to look at the size um, of that system and how, what the cost to repair the roof was. And maybe it's a drop in the bucket or maybe it covers a pretty darn good chunk of it. Um, but we do that quite a bit. We do that quite a bit. And then, you know, there's certainly not much on an annual basis from the lease revenue, but you get your new roof. Um, and then you have a project. Right. Would we be then be on the hook? So if we, if we did that and we were taking the lease payments, and the roof was repaired, but then, and this is a 20 year? Lease. Yes, 20 years, yeah, 20 So years. 15 years down the road, we have a new issue with, with the roof where we need to remove the, the panels to do the repair. Like, That's a good point. Could we, uh, we're on the hook to do that, and are probably obligated so that they can get back up and running, correct? Yes and no, I'll put it this way. That's a pretty good, a pretty strong negotiating point that I get to every time I do a rooftop project. Um, but there, there's flexibility there to okay. work it out. When it's a new roof, we're pretty comfortable taking risks with handling problems that come later. Yep. If it's 10 years old and we're going up there, it's like, okay, if, if at year 25 we're having problems, we agree that your roof is very old. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we definitely talk through that. Uh, about the RFP, RFQ, I totally understand your point. The RFQ is what I feel like allows me to come in and have like very open, honest conversations and then eventually get to a proposal. Um, it just it puts me in a position to, to, to give a much better proposal. That, that would change the next to say that. Jason, did you want to? I just, I mean, Eric and I do double duty. We're both on our elementary committees. And just as a piece of information I can bring from being on the Plimpton committee, we were approached about putting solar on our building. We have three different roof styles on that building. And all of them presented their own issues. But the biggest issue was the one that you just asked about, the, the roof repair while you have solar on top. And it turns into a quagmire. Um, the end of the day, the decision after much consulting was we'd only go forward if we had a new roof. With solar on the roof, and we know where we we are financially. We know where we are with the water infiltration on our roof. And right. Well, I, I think one of the things that potentially would, would help us. I mean, just me as a homeowner, I've not done it because exactly that. I'm like, I don't want it. You know, it's new. You don't want we to don't move around these problems if you can see it down the down the pipe. But what I I want to know is what is the worst case scenario? So say we do need to remove the the solar panels from the roof and then put them back up. That doesn't mean we're buying new panels. We're just taking them down, making our repair, and putting them back up. Yep. What would that cost? And I know you don't know because you don't yeah. know the size. But yeah, I mean, it'd well, be good to just find that the roof out. Roof is flat. I think it is flat up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be a balanced system, so it wouldn't be attached. Um, if it was a standing seam metal roof and we were attached, it would be a almost impossible. Um, up there, if there, if there is a leak, you can certainly move sections of it. Um, just to kind of give an example, I have a, a, a lease that was signed recently where um, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a, you know, it kind of fits with this mold. It's like, it, it's old, but it's not getting replaced, but it should be okay sort of deal. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, we, we kind of came up with an agreement that in the first 10 years, the majority of any cost that would happen, um, that, that might pop up from a roof repair, the landowner, the building owner was going to cover a higher, uh, actually almost all of it. In the back 10 years, we would start as, there's a, there's a graph that as it gets later in the project, we would take on more risk for roof repair. So as that roof is, you know, 25, 30 years old, we understand that it may go and, and we're okay to take money at that point too. And if I'm correct, isn't there a, a, a weight load? Yeah, yeah, yeah we need to pass a structural um, analysis too. And often the roof isn't designed for solar, mm -hmm. whether or not that might be a possibility. Yeah, most times it's the metal roofs that are kind of um, pre-engineered, um, prefabricated, excuse me, um, buildings that can't handle anything more than what's up there. Um, generally, the flat roofs can, but it's, if not, a blanket, it shouldn't be a blanket statement. Everyone needs to be evaluated. Yeah, Mark, you have one quick one. one. Microinverters, or do you use a gang inverters? Micros versus gang. So I yeah, think you string, don't have an inverter. Is that the same thing string versus central inverters? Yeah. Yeah. So we generally use string inverters. Um, it uh, on carports absolutely because we actually attach them up there. <laughs> string inverters are small inverters that are spread, spread throughout the system. It it um, converts the direct current to alternating current, so DC to AC. Um, but 
they can get really, really big if you use a central one. It, it tends to take up space, so we, we, we usually use string inverters. Um, but it, it's kind of project specific. And each string is its own inverter, so it's a problem you only lose that string. Yeah, it's kind of like your Christmas tree lights. If one of them goes out, um, sometimes they all go out, but um, some configurations only that one. It's yeah, lower nice. amperage. Yeah, it's kind of the same. On site. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. I do have a problem with yeah. when you, Your diagrams have shown a, you know, the nice picture of the possibilities, and you talked about the group talking. Is there any other, do you see any other possibilities? Um, 20 acres of uh, woodland available, or you wouldn't want to? Uh, we'd be interested in, in woodland, yeah. I actually didn't, um, I didn't look at that. Uh, no. My, my town will not support cutting down any trees. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know what the bylaw in, um, in town is here about that, That's exactly trees. it. The, yeah. They don't want you to cut trees down. Okay, yeah, Plymouth is the same way now. Um, but for quite a while, you, you, you can cut trees down Plymouth. Um, you know a tree is a massive water pump. Transpiration, it's like perspiration for vegetation. If we cut down a bunch of trees, our wetlands become wetter. We have problems. We need to be very judicious about cutting around here. Yeah, to your point, this is why there are a lot of small projects in this area of the state and very few big projects. Um, out west, there's plenty, there's plenty out west. Western Mass, there's plenty of space. So it tends to happen out there, but some very rare trees are cut down. However, the row of white pine trees that but cause us the all kinds of maintenance well. problems every single storm, I'm yeah. sure, are going to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And they also, those would cast shade on quite a big portion of that area. So that's something we're trying to do. There are some small All right, do we have any other questions at this point? I thought I'd ask. No. What's name? Yes, sir. Mark. I think this definitely speaks to your, your focus throughout your tenure here. It, it's to bring revenue into the schools to show the towns that we have skin in the game, but it also has that educational aspect looking forward to future jobs that might not even exist yet, so the kids every day can see that in their daily lives. Thanks, I, I think in the near future you'll see a CTE program for this industry, and I think you'll be on the cutting edge of doing that. I, if it was a zero dollar and I was still on this committee, I would be voting for it just for the for the for that aspect of it. Um, however, the incentive to have revenue, as, as Jason said, is is I think we are as a school committee should always consider every revenue source we can possibly bring back to our communities to help do that. And you've got a couple of teachers' salaries in there, so I, I think uh, as we go forward, so I would recommend to this committee that we pursue it and continue to pursue it until it becomes something that uh, you know just isn't cost effective. Thank you. Our board. Yeah. 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 I've been on board. Yeah. 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 But I'm also uh, short. Sure. You're very helpful. I, actually, uh, I don't know. One gunshot idea. I'm just curious. Um, the fields that we have, uh, yes. the sports fields in particular, um, do you only go 12 to 13 feet high, or could you put something up there good enough that would go over our football field? Over the whole football field? Yeah. Kind of like a dome? Yeah. Uh, well, no. I, th I, I To hear I could, all our players earlier? I, 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 I see some potential here of putting the lights on the other side of the canopy. We have a south-facing uh, bleachers. Um, I, I guess the short answer is no. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not impossible. No, I, mean, I did. I asked the lights. I asked the lights. I know. I, I saw it in the question. email. At, at some point, I bet you that will, will be fair game. Um, almost like an A-frame that stands over, you know, a whole barn is what I meant to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's not, that would be kind of like a custom, you know, right now we have ground mounts, roof mounts, and carports. Right. Um, there actually is an incentive um, for floating solar panels in Massachusetts yeah. right now. We call it Float Um But yeah, there's, there's a test project going on in Carver for a 10 kilowatt system that, that floats on a little. On oh, cranberry pond? Yeah, I don't know how it works. But yeah, I, I know. But that's kind of in the hopper, so yeah. something like that is going to come at some point. I just, I just saw it as a potential, and I didn't, you know, fine, take it up fifty. So, you know, I thought it might be. Eric, I'd, I'd like to move that we ask the administration to uh, pursue the RFP RFQ process in rel relative to second keeping going forward with the solar initiative. Any uh, conversation? Any well, second, and then we can. No, um, Eddie seconded you. He did. I'm going to pass it to Christine because we did chat a little bit. Can about we this. briefly discuss this? And we don't have the expertise in house to do a lot of this, and we have to rely on consultants. 
So I just wanted to make sure that it was known that that's the avenue we have to pursue. And we did speak to the person that Josh had read, but we spoke to Plymouth, mm -hmm. and then we spoke to the himself that they used. And what we had, we told them we had a presentation tonight, so tomorrow we're going to speak to him with questions that we, we at least know that yeah. some of the questions. Yeah. And then I think we want, we're going to speak with him and just kind of see if he can kind of give us direction on what our next step would be, and if he can quantify what that next step would be. Do, do we have any ballpark pricing for that, it? Exactly, or? that's exactly right. We don't, we didn't have that yet, so okay. what I'm going to ask is if I can share your presentation with him, just so he has an idea of the direction we'd like to go in. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we could start to kind of assess what that is. I have just have no idea what the scope of that is just yet. Well, I can amend my motion to, to investigate the consultant to move forward with the project. How's that? Do I have a second? Sorry. Any conversation about that before we vote? There is, um, and I'm not current with them, but uh, I was on the Jones River Board for, mm -hmm. I don't know, a while. And um, there is an institution that is housed down there called the Wind Sun Institute. Yeah. Are they, are they I'm, not? I'm on the Jones River Board now. They're not. They're not? They're because they used to do control. this kind of consulting essentially for free. Yeah. But they don't do it anymore. And I, I have the New Day Energies, another Kingston gentleman that would be willing to consult for mm -hmm. free also. The, the person we spoke to is who, um, Gary Poston, the business manager from Plymouth, who um, Josh was kind enough to sort of uh, give us some idea of the project in Plymouth. We spoke to the consultant that he used. Mm -hmm. um, they have a pretty massive project out in Plymouth. So um, that's. And they spent, we have no idea what they spent for the consultant. Um, this is what they've had an ongoing commitment to this, and they've been doing this for some time, and they've had a lot of success with it. So each product is different, but they are having a lot, a great amount of cost avoidance yes. or cost savings with the products they've done. So, but he didn't get into specifics just because we don't know this, the scope of our project versus yeah. the scope of their project. Okay. I, I can certainly give some contacts for that as well. There are definitely going to be folks that we on their RFPs for, so you may not want them. Um, but to that, to you talk about Plymouth for a minute. Yes. We we've won RFPs with Plymouth, and we've also not won RFPs with Plymouth. And, and I think just the point to that is each project is is kind of unique, and for that project you need to grab the developer that makes the most sense for that project. They recently had one out that included um, a couple of there were a couple other pieces to it. It was a, it was a very broad um, RFP, and, and we weren't the best fit for it, uh, which. Yeah. Right. And, and I'd, I'd just like to speak that there are different levels and types of solar companies. There are local, does homes, there's um, Solec. Yeah, that's how we met. Solec uh, is, a, is a big company, but they, they are focused on a particular size and scope of project. And, um, you know, they refer to each other often to, to have a good match. And I think of all the presentations we've heard, which is all two or three, that this particular size company seems to represent what we're looking for that can give us the best value for what we're doing. Type of, type of, not necessarily specifically his company. But I think we ought to move forward with um, resolving this issue. I understand your staffing issues and you're not really funded to go out and, and do that kind of revenue development. But um, I think it should be as Silver Lake moves forward that somebody's job description becomes this kind of project because you, you otherwise you're going to miss out on opportunities with grant writing too. So, right. but well, we've got a motion on the table. Um, are any other comments before we take a vote? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstain? That's it. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thanks for time, everybody. Thank you. We'll we'll back. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we no probably Thank kept you a lot longer than Thanks. you wanted to be. Thanks, everybody. Well, that was long. Long, yeah. long about that. Sure. Um, You're going to do a great job. All right, so folks, we're going to take a short break to. I'll start with the heavy stuff and one to the fun stuff. We have the two handbook changes that we had proposed last month meeting. Um, the first one was the update to our athletic handbook, the um, captain selection process, followed by the, um, the wording about the family ID and registration cutoffs. And then we prefer to go, to go all at the end. If you want to go on each one individually. So As a group. And what, what total they were yes. all seen when we got had the presentation. The CTE, so, okay. so the CTE edition, just to add in the language, um, increasing our offense for vaping in school, 
And then we have um, modifying some of our language for our in-school suspension because it carries over to the extracurricular activities for that day. And then the other handout is just a district update um, for our suspension procedure um, so that we're all kind of on the same page and following the same protocol. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve the new handbook wording for the high school handbook. Second. And are we doing it all at once? And the athletic? Is that all part of the student handbook? There are two pieces. Okay. One's the athletic, one's the student. Okay. And do we have a second? Jason second. second. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Good. We're good. Thank you for your support. Um, I wanted to highlight some of our student events um, in the last month. Um, one of our students, Nick Hatch, son of Paula Hatch, or um, chairperson, he was awarded the MADA CTE Student of the Year. Um, so mm -hmm. That's our Silver Lake representative, so he was honored last month in Worcester. Um, our students, our student council is finalizing our third and final pep rally for the year to honor our spring sports participants, our drama students, and of course our academic achievement that they honor each term. We had two of our students recognized in the United Patriot Scholar. Athlete uh, Banquet, Madison Milbert, who will be attending the Naval Academy, and Will Belchermont, who will be attending the RPI. And recently, our spring drama students wrapped up their production of Airline. Their director is in the room with us over there, Mr. Aaron and Ms. Gary, um, as well as the Art Showcase, which is on display for a few days. Um, so we kind of tied the two events together to, to draw the crowds, and it was a great, um, both nights were great evenings for our community. We are currently in the thick of AP testing. We have 275 students taking over 600 AP tests. We're almost done with week one. Week two starts next week. Our math MCAS is coming up on May 23rd and 24th. And then our physics MCAS testing will be June 6th and 7th. And then finally on my agenda, um, some updates about our upcoming graduation for the class of 2008. Their prom will be next Friday, May 18th, followed by a week of exams. And then the rehearsals begin the week of May 29th, and we will be in our second year of our new tradition with the senior parade, where students will be able to parade through the halls of their high school, middle school, and elementary schools, one last hurrah, walk down memory lane. It was a big success last year. The students have requested to do it again right. this year. Good. Um, first student will be donating the buses, and the drivers will be donating their time. Um, so it's a, it's a nice nice event that we pull together with support from all the schools. So if you're able to make it to any of the buildings that day, if you're not already currently in one, I highly, highly recommend it. It's a pretty cool experience. Uh, graduation will be June 2nd. Senior war set is May 31st. Invitations are in the mail for everybody for graduation. And I would just like to end um, by thanking our teachers at Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, they go above and beyond every single day. Um, and recently at the Plymouth County Education Association, we had several of our staff members who were presented with awards. And I'm going to quickly read them. I know we're short on time, but I really want to acknowledge them here. We have two outstanding rookies, Kristen Schoff and Jennifer Strand, our Spanish teacher and school psychologist. And then we had several staff members who have given honor awards, Ms. Schreer, Mr. Aruda, Ms. Stefaniak, Ms. Tringali, Ms. Redding, Ms. Cahill, Ms. Orca, Ms. Vanison, Ms. Hines, Ms. Pierce, Ms. Leonti, Ms. Bates, Ms. Drew, Mr. Mixo, Mr. Mello, Mr. Gregory, Ms. Barry, Mr. Tilly, Ms. Close, Ms. Rakowski, Ms. Dawn White, Ms. Sweeney, Ms. Ritchie, Mr. Weber, Ms. Rudin, Mr. Doobie, Ms. Frazier, Ms. Lopes, Mr. McCarthy, and Ms. Ferreira. Awesome. So, awesome. Shout out to all of them. Yeah. Way to go. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Did I go fast enough? Perfect. Really well. Yeah. I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> stage and I see a second person come to light that you don't always see in the classroom. So uh, I just want to say what a phenomenal job they all do and along with Nurse Bay and, um, and her helpers. So anyway, uh, if you get a chance, May 19th, May 20th, come see the show. It's going to be incredible. Um, my student handbook, um, we also have the district policy process policy that Michaela talked about, uh, dress code which was in and um, we're adding a student safety plan for students that violate our drugs, alcohol, weapon policy. Um, again, that's to ensure they make safe decisions in our school. And um, 
we have the district's uh, equal opportunity. Um, and those are the you know, folks that I just asked for a vote to approve the handbook changes. I'll make a motion to, ch to accept the handbook changes to the middle school. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Um, MCAS testing, so we had 270 students uh, to MCAS testing for eighth grade math. Uh, this week we completed that. We have one more week of testing. We have our seventh grade math and our eighth grade science. And that will take place next week, and we will be done with our MCAS 2.0 testing. Um, for student events, we've had um, four students uh, that put in for a mark annual submission. I just want to mention our students, Dustin Devoney, Gavin McKinnon, Aiden Ardoyle, Sarah Thomas, created a video uh, to highlight uh, discrimination and acceptance, and they won second place at the annual event. So I'm going to give them a recognition. I have the video. I'm not going to show it tonight, but I am going to share it out so that uh, that she'll send it out to all you guys. So when you get a second take a look, it's very creative, very powerful, and it's in our kids. Uh, making some really uh, positive videos. So make sure that that gets shared out to you guys. So thank you for that. And then uh, National History Week, um, we have students that went to the regional finals, and we have two students, uh, Zachary Kramer and Timothy Owens, that qualified for the national finals for the History Week, which is going to be June, Friday, June 1st, Saturday, June 2nd, down in Atlanta. And I want to give them recognition for making it to the national level to compete against anyone around the nation that goes and, and uh, they really deserve recognition for their hard work. So we're excited about them going down and competing at the national level. Uh, we have our Scholar Leader Dinner on Wednesday, May 16th. Abigail Powers, Evan Barkowski are our Scholar Leaders. They represent demonstrate academic achievement, service to our classmates, positive role models for our peers, integrity, honesty, and courage. And uh, they will be recognized at our Scholar Leader Dinner on May 16th. So congratulations to Abigail and Evan. We also have an art display that's happening at the Kingston Public Library throughout the month of May. And there's also a reception uh, that's going to happen Saturday, May 19th from 2 to 4. So if you get a chance to go by the Kingston Public Library, you will see our students on display with uh, our 8th grade art uh, program. So um, that's always something that's really nice to see. And then we have two, dona two donations that I just need votes on. Um, $2,000 for a tech engineering teacher, Julie Walker from Power Engineers. Uh, they donate $1,657. We have anonymous donators. They have $300. And that was to allow us to purchase a 3D printer for our tech engineering classes at our 3D printing club, which is able us to 3D design and printing for our students for prototypes and engineering design projects. So we're very excited about that, bringing that to the middle school. Again, that's a program that uh, we all worked hard on bringing it back to the middle school a few years back. It's really playing some dividends to our students. So thank you for that. I'll say the second one, maybe you can vote both at the same time. And that's to Anna Walsh and Andrew Lewis, a $500 grant. Andrew Lewis and Anna Walsh are the 2018 recipients of the ARC of Greater Plymouth Inspired Teacher Grant, Spreading Inclusion. It is to honor and support our commitment to inclusive education and the recognition of how inclusive classroom education enhances the mission and powers to support people with disabilities and their families to go on and contribute and thrive. And I just want to say congratulations to Anna and Andrea for their hard work and pulling that grant in. And I ask that we accept uh, both of these donations. Do your motion? Make a motion to accept both of the donations. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Unanimous? Thank you. On to school district business, Director of Business Services, Christine Haley. Thank you very much. Over the last quarter of the year, we've worked our way through eagerly. Um, we are constantly reviewing to our budget to make sure we've done everything we committed to doing and we're going to cover it. It's included. As you go through, you'll see there are a few areas of concern, but we are working our way through it. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Because the issues that we've had, things that are the issues are now with at least it's the LPS, it's something startling there, but um, we've had some utility issues in homeless transportation and the uh, South Street account, things like that. But one thing I did want to mention about the utility accounts, um, our gas account gave us a surprise this year with the cold sell that we had in January, where our contract for gas allows for 20% overage of our usage. And on January 5th of this year, the rates for gas just went through the roof. 
able to obtain a significant amount for our overage. So we're, our contract ends at the end of July. So we're actually looking at new contracts. This has given us a, just some additional questions to ask and some other areas to look at. So we are looking at that so that we go into this property and we kind of make the best choice that we can going forward. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Right. Any questions before we move on? All right, Assistant Superintendent, to approve. So in front of you, uh, in your packet, you have the curriculum instruction and assessment update. Um, there is only one item for the sake of time that I'd like to pull out of this report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about any item here. Um, that item was the, the STEM Expo on April 9th. Um, and what a wonderful event that was. I just wanted to say thank you to Scott Farrell and the STE teachers for organizing it. It was so nice to see students of different ages participating. It was certainly a wonderful way to encourage an interest and to display uh, understanding and to promote understanding of science, technology, and engineering. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you. That was, that was very good. <laughs> Uh, Superintendent Joy Black. Thank you. Um, you have in your packet a draft schedule. Uh, we have been talking about uh, trying to pull together a schedule where we would stretch out school committees instead of every month going to every six weeks, and then when, we're in, when we are in budget season, which basically runs from well, most of my life um, January through March, April, um, we would go back to a monthly meeting. So you have a one-page document. It is based on the old Rochester uh, document that uh, I shared with you earlier. We sort of use the same format. Um, what happens is, and I, I just want to, you to sort of understand our lives, it's sort of like a puzzle. Remember, we have four different school committees that happen every single month. And if we move one, it impacts other ones because unfortunately, neither Christine or I or Jill have figured out how to split ourselves in two yet. Um, for instance, it's Kingston Town Meeting tonight, and obviously I'm not there. Monday night is Kingston School Committee. It's also Halifax Town Meeting. So, you know, this is sort of um, the way things go. So it was, it was kind of a complicated process. So you can see the schedule that I put together. I'm going to ask you to just look at it and see if it makes some sense to you. It is basically every six weeks from September, October, and then December. Then you'll notice that January, February, March, and April are all the traditional second Thursday of the month. And again, that is in the height of budget season. We can obviously add meetings anytime we so chose. Um, but that, just to give you a sense of it. Um, Lisa also put in here the public budget here and school choice hearing so you could see some of the important dates. Um, then we went back to like a six week for May and then we would schedule July for the closeout. Um, I think this brings us down for so like the two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine meetings as opposed to the traditional 12, which is really more 11 because traditionally we haven't always met in August. Um, but this would give you a sense of what this could look like. Um, very open to ideas, but again, you have to sort of see Silver Lake as a puzzle within the other three committees to really get a sense of it. One thing I did want to point out, and again, uh, committee's purview, but if we were to stay to the traditional second Thursday, we do fall on Valentine's Day, um, which is, may or may not be the most exciting night for some people, I don't know. Um, just wanted to point that out. Um, we also try to put in a concept of this. Quit smiling, Mark. My wife's there. gone, so I can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that smile. Um, so the Joint School Committee, we also try to throw those in. You know, we will have to have about three. We've never really tried to schedule them before. Um, but again, this is a new concept for us. Um, I don't know how people will, will feel about it, but um, this was the best I could come up with, um, basing it on the way Old Rochester scheduled there, but keeping our budget season every month for the, those four months, the critical months. Um, we also could, you know, there is some discussion about trying to have some of the bigger presentations all one night, um, you know, like Marie's presentation, whether or not we'd want to move that like in September or something when we had the joint meeting anyway, so it's just once. Um, you know, there's some different ways we could do this, but this is some food for thought. Uh, that's first, a, that's first a great attempt. idea. Can you find like what, what do, for the joint meetings, I know we vote the shared cost contracts, and yep. what other things do we need to do at the joint meetings? Um, we vote some of the common contracts, um, train parks, pick up, the school bus contracts, one of the ones we have to do with that. So it's more of the common 
I am so going to do it for once. We'll do it for the whole region. Okay. So normally what we have to do is there may be some contracts that we'll have to do, like we'll probably have a meeting, I assume, this spring. I mean, well, no, this summer. summer. This summer? Yeah, spring, I'm dreaming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this summer we'll have one to, to go out to bid so we can sort of move things around a little bit. Um, and then we always have one during budget season to vote the shared cost budget. So it's, you know, usually about three a year is fairly common. Um, there's usually one shared cost to go over my time. Go over my evaluation. Jay, um, having another one, or at least one other one scheduled during budget season, do, do you think that maybe just to have it planned ahead? Have it um, anyway. I don't believe we've ever done that, um, but we could if you so we chose. Always, well, I'm just. I'm I mean, just I don't think we've ever scheduled it ahead of time. Okay, I'm just sending out yep. because we always seem to end up having we one have, that we yeah. kind of are trying to. Get one figured out. Right. I'm just trying to ask. Yeah. No, it, it's not a bad idea to think ahead. I just want to sh throw it out there. Right. I'm yep. not saying we're going to do this. I just right. want to say. Uh, I think sometimes we I don't like know idea. when we need to have it. Exactly. You know, so we when don't know exactly when we're going to have all the numbers together in order to right. have that sort of right. extra necessary meeting. Yeah. So. Right. But the know. thing is, I I know when we've been trying to do it. Oh, I can't be here. I can't be here. Uh, you know, everybody is like saying that. Well, if you already have a set point at some point that would seem logical that we we're usually able we'll to get more I'm just you know we need to vote something okay more. I just yeah. wanted to send yeah. it out there yeah I know I know no it is nice to plan ahead I'll yeah. give you that yeah. <laughs> okay. so this sure. is again just a draft we're not going to be voting on this great <clears throat> thought please send me any um, thoughts that you have on it um, sympathy cards whichever um, thank about you the schedule. Yeah. so this is just an attempt uh, to begin the process I'd like to point out when I got on this committee, it was twice a month, plus a budget meeting. If I was staying, that'd be all over this. And yeah. I, but <laughs> no. I do agree with that. You should have the budget meeting scheduled so people can circle it on their calendar. And you can always move it. Right. That's yeah. true. Yeah. 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 Sure. Just an idea. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it's, no, it's, it's good, good to have it on the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Just let me know and we'll work with it. This is our first attempt at it. No, that's great. Thank you for putting it together so we can kind of visualize it exactly more. and we've never done all of them on one page um this one helped page. me to realize why we always feel a little disjointed when you're like you crazy think? people because uh, it you know it is a lot of meetings yeah, okay. um so the next one is just budget discussion town meeting update um i did want to let everyone know that kingston has voted to support our budget yay kingston, Thank you, kingston. Um, hey. there was a hold though it wasn't it wasn't easy no it, it wasn't but that was actually more elementary but yeah. um some misunderstandings but the, so the kingston did vote our silver lake budget the next meeting is next monday the 14th um and then it's in halifax and then plimpton is the 16th which is wednesday um Again, just to sort of summarize, the town of Halifax, neither the finance nor the selectmen have voted to support Silver Lake. Um, you know, we will go to bat on town meeting floor um, to see if we can get the voters of Halifax to support it. I'm, I, um, we will absolutely do our best um, and be prepared to speak to it. In Plimpton, both the finance committee and the selectmen have voted to support the budget, so we anticipate that the town uh, will vote to support the budget. As long as two towns vote to support the budget, the budget will go through, and whether Halifax votes it or not, they will have to pay the assessment. Um, the town of Halifax, with, under their levy, does have the ability to pay their assessment without causing issues. They have just chosen not to support the number that we came up with. Um, so what? that's sort of the regs. Um, what night's I had, that? Monday night. This Monday night. This Monday, Monday night. night. Um, and I will let everybody, I'll text them from the town meeting, assuming we get to it Monday night, I hope. Um, I have reviewed the educational laws and regulations so we know what our process will be if, um, God forbid, if two towns chose not to support the budget. I don't anticipate that being an issue, um, but if you're interested, I could go through that with you. But I'm not going to because I don't want to jinx us, and I have very good feelings that we'll not have a problem. Um, but just to give you that update. Um, and the next one is recognition. Um, on a personal level, if I may just very briefly, I know it's, it's quick. Um, I want to thank Mark Aubrey first. Um, it's the Mark night um, for the Mark show. Um, so Mark has um, 
brings, I think, something that I'm not sure everybody realizes, although I think most people do, is Mark has a great background with vocational, and he has been a huge help and is always very concerned about the rights of our students. Um, if you've ever listened to Mark's comments, he's always concerned, is every student available to go to those activities? Uh, you know, how are we supporting them? What's the financial impact for the families? Um, and I think he has really been a very strong voice for all of us in terms of academics and the rights of all of our students. Uh, I really, truly appreciate that. I think we always need someone to be the voice of the underdog, and he has always really managed to do that. Also, I can't tell you what a good sport Mark has been doing policy this year. We had 112 <laughs> policies, 112, and even knowing that he still chose to share the committee. So, wait, chose? I think Eric had something to do with being chose. Okay. <laughs> you think I bought that? Got that one, Akron? Huh, anyway, he, he stuck with it, and we did get through all 112. And I, I really do want to thank him for that and, and all of the um, insights that he brought to the committee. Um, so he only did three years, but they were three very good years. And, and I personally really appreciate everything that he brought to the table. So thank you. Thank you. It's been a very enjoyable and a, a great learning experience for myself as well. And I will continue to support the committee in my new role whenever I can. Thank you. Okay. We appreciate thank you, that. And I'd like to add to that too. Um, you know, I think you have been a great advocate for kid, for all of the kids, like she said. But especially, you know, in our discussions, you've always said, you know, there's kids outside of sports, they're doing other things, and you've always been a big advocate for that. You know, and, and, and I would say personally, you know, I've learned from you, and, um, you know, I appreciate, you know, spending the time that I've, I've been on the board with you. Thank you, you very much. Mark, we don't know Where do you start with Mark? Just a decade. Uh, yeah, so, so Mark's been with us for a decade. Um, you know, I have to say that um, building background was not always my strong point. I have learned more than I ever chose to or wish to about sewers and buildings Send and you facilities. More pictures. Um, and Mark has always been incredibly patient and with a great sense of humor. Um, he has been a very strong advocate about us you know, going forward with grants, going forward with solar. Um, he has never get, let us off the hook about that and I really appreciate that. He does not ever let me not do my job. Um, he has really kept me honest, um, and he has made me stay informed, and I have to say that I, I truly appreciate that. Um, you know, the other thing that Mark brings is he brings a really strong background with STEM, um, and Mark has been a huge science advocate for our students. I think some of the STEM initiatives that we have, I think we can directly relate to you. Um, you know, you have really um, forced us to stay on top of issues that may have fallen by the wayside if it wasn't for you. Um, you know, our new allied health program, you have been an incredible advocate for that. You have always been on CTE. Um, you go to all the meetings, um, even if you fly in from Australia or Denmark or wherever the night before, um, you know, you have always answered my text. You've always picked up the phone no matter what country you're in. So um, on a very personal level, um, I will really miss you. I am not deleting either of your numbers from my cell phone. So I just want you to know um, you'll still be hearing from me. Um, um, right and I, again, I, I really do appreciate all you have brought to the table. Thank you. Well, and thank you very much, every one of you. I'm going to miss. Yeah. Uh, I know it's time for me to move on, and I have some other focuses that I'd like to do. And, and I appreciate that all those agenda items that I've been working on for the last 10 years all seem to be coming to fruition as I'm leaving. <laughs> I, I also think that I'm leaving the, this committee in very good hands, and, and that means for all the towns, but particularly the, the folks that have run uh, for election. Uh, the technology, you have somebody uh, somebody else that came from a school council position like I did to come to the school committee. Um, you're you're going to be, be uh, new and innovative ideas, I think, is what really makes all of us come together because we have a different way of, and we share those views. We have three different towns, three different ideologies that come with those different towns and, and uh, economics, but we all can make a good decision. I think we make very good decisions. And uh, I want to recommend that we keep our autonomy, that we always realize that we are from three different towns, but we are the last advocate for these kids and the school and the teachers. And that we should, uh, I was talking to Joy today, and it was about challenge. And you've heard me say that our program should challenge every child. But we also should challenge every teacher. We should challenge every administrator to create the programs that challenge these, these uh, individuals. Um, and, I, and then the other thing, and remember that, that 
we're the first line of defense. The school's first. Our towns are second, but a close second. Good schools will directly, directly influence the property values of a town and thus the mm -hmm. tax rate. So without a good school system, you have chaos in your community and nobody wants to live there. Your pro property values go down and you don't have that. Challenge yourselves to determine the difference between the want and the need. Okay, we hear that and we understand our teachers and our administrators are embedded in, the, in these day-to-day -day activities, but if they have a, a difference between a want and need, have them sell it to you to the point they convince you that it's a need versus a want. And also, the best advice I can give my fellow school committee members is, above all, never be afraid to say you were wrong and change your mind. Because we're, we all have different perspectives, and uh, I think we're a good team. So thank you very much for letting me serve with you guys, all of you. Really enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then the last thing on mind was cafeteria update. Um, I believe the word may be out, but I just wanted to make it official. Um, David Zioli, our director of food services, has submitted his uh, retirement. Um, and I really want to thank him for the time he has spent with us. So we have currently advertised on School Spring. And um, I put the word out well, to everybody I know, actually, um, with some listservs that we have. Um, I also did reach out to Chartwells, you may remember, we talked about the possibility of finding out what they would have to offer, what kind of contracts they have. Um, I did do a little research about some surrounding districts. Chartwells has a great reputation with some school systems. They tend to be the bigger school systems. Brockton, for instance, works with Chartwells. Um, the, those systems love Chartwells. They have done a fantastic job with them. Um, there are some smaller districts that haven't been as happy with Chartwells. They like having their own food service director. What I've heard from everyone is it's about fit. That seems to be the, the big thing, is who fits in your community. I don't know what that's going to be yet, um, but if you like, I can invite Chartwells to come in in June um, and see if they would, you know, that you could just see a presentation of what they have to offer. Um, they, they can come in and manage our current staff. It doesn't mean our staff would need to be let go. Um, you can just hire them as the managers of your food service program. Um, so there's several different ways we can go with this. Um, you know, this will be something that will be in real time because obviously we need someone to open our cafeteria next next fall, um, and that is not something any of the three of us are doing. Um, so you know, I I will be you know we're advertising in school spring. I think we're about mm, close to 20 people have applied, um, and some of them actually look pretty darn good. How much um, longer is it going to be before you start? seeing the individuals? Well, I think we'll probably go until, well, I have to get through budget season um, before I start doing those interviews, but probably early June would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe after graduation. Um, yeah, right now. So, so um, if you decide not to hire a director, now that you've advertised the position, are you obligated no. to just decide you your no, I probably would do it simultaneously. I wouldn't go with Charles without also seeing what's out there. I mean, I would do them simultaneously. Um, but I didn't, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a strong advocate either way. I mean, from talking with all the surrounding superintendents, everyone has said it's about the fit. It's about having the right person that can, can work within your district, that can, you know, provide um, a good lunch slash breakfast, depending on, on where we're, we're talking about. Um, and also can meet our, you know, our students' requests and needs and make it solid. You know, as you know, we started off, well, when I started, I discovered a quarter million dollar deficit, um, not the rock I had hoped to turn over. Um, but since then, you know, we are solid. Uh, you know, just barely, but we are. Um, so it's, it's something that it's important to have the right person that can, that can provide that. But if you're interested, I could ask Charles to come in, maybe do a 10-minute presentation in June. I think they're worth looking at. Um, I would appreciate your insights into whether you um, are interested in having them come in. Um, I would probably also invite, if any Kingston uh, people are interested in coming, I would probably invite them in also because um, our food service director also covers Kingston and Plympton. So I didn't like them in all South. Mm -hmm. When we talked about it before, um, there was interest in Charles, if you remember when we were talking about budgets. Um, so from from just the school community perspective, I don't have any interest in seeing their ten minute presentation. I, I think that's 
absolutely under your purview to make that decision on your own. Okay. Personally. Any other thoughts? Uh, I'd rather see a local individual opposed to outside. Okay. I think it's worth considering all the options. Oh, I'm not saying don't, but I prefer to have somebody. Is it worth bringing them in so people could see it and also um, the public could see it? You know, if it's a, if it's at a public meeting, I, because, see, yeah, I, I, would, I would think it might make sense to yeah. have them come because if you're going to start interviewing at the beginning of June, you've got to make a decision. So you would need some guidance. Would you need a vote on that? Someone's? No, the no. position is under under me. But okay. I, what I was interested in was just, you know, Chartwells has approached us a few times mm -hmm. that there had been a person in the audience a couple months ago that had come from Chartwells. They approach every school system. It's right. Not, it's not that we're that special. Um, but we, you know, my, some people have been extremely happy with the food products and services that Chartwells has been able to bring. I, with Ed, I've always sort of preferred local, yeah. but a lot of it, again, is fit and financially, it has a big impact on us if, if we don't have the right person in the job. Right. So. I, ju I just think it brings in a layer of bureaucracy and it, it may well. That just it may well. Um, but I'm not opposed to it. I'm not saying. I'm just. Right. Right. I know how I am leaning towards it. So. But does it? When you say fit, so if you bring in someone like Chartwells and you and the person they put in your school system doesn't fit, you can just say to them, "This isn't fitting. Find so, another person." Um, uh, you know, that's part of what we need to find out a little bit about is their contracts. Um, my understanding is that you know you can contract Chartwells, you can hire their people, you can have their managers, yeah. but they also, for many surrounding districts, they keep their local cafeteria stuff. The people are working in the schools, right, sure. and then they bring in a manager. Um, so I think you know again, we got one contract from Chartwells. I think it was twenty pages, maybe something. Like that. It was it was a fairly lengthy contract. So we're really in just the beginning stages, I and mean, my focus right now is to get a budget. Mm -hmm. um, but right after I get a budget, we got to feed the kids. So with, <laughs> with, with, with bringing in a company like that, do they have better buying power than we do to you know, have better product than we would? That's why I want to have them come in. I mean, yeah. I, I assume that. I mean, Will they cook for us? Yeah. <laughs> I, again, I, I, I've only gone as far as reaching out. Um, and there's more than one company. Um, you know, I've only picked Charles because that is the local company that has gone to other surrounding districts. Are you leaving us, Mark? Yeah, I have to go pick up the child. I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mark. Bye, Thank Thank you, Mark. Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so if, if it sounds like there's a, a few people interested, I know Paula had been interested in Still seeing it. Um, I'm going to ask them to come in in June. Let's just see what they have to offer, and we'll uh, simultaneously, Christine and I, and I'll probably reach out to some other administrators, we'll start the interviewing process, um, and we'll sort of see what makes the most sense for us. Great. Thank you. All right, so um, reports of special committees. We, uh, we don't have old business. We already discussed that, right? The yeah. Discussion. yeah. So reports of special committees on um, SLEA. We waited long enough. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sure. So I'm Jess Cahill. I'm um, on the SLEA e board. Due to a family emergency, um, the president uh, is not is unable to be here with us this evening. So she's asked me to read a statement for her. Um, she said the SLEA would like to thank the town of Kingston for their continued support of Silver Lake Regional High School and Middle Schools budgets. We look forward to the upcoming Plumpton and Halifax town meetings and hope that we are able to uh, have a successfully pass a 2018-2019 school budget. The SLEA also thanks the committee and the administrators uh, for their hard work in creating a budget. As the school year comes to a close, we want to take a minute to appreciate that the teachers are as hard at work as ever. They are finalizing their student preparations for AP tests, creating new curriculum, and ensuring that the students stay focused and motivated as the temperature warms up. While we look forward to a successful finish to the year, we are gearing up uh, to continue our work over the summer. Our teachers are committed to providing rigorous and supportive learning environment and thank the many community members who support our efforts. We are looking forward to our summer funner school. Um, and we also are looking forward to seeing all of you at graduation. As you know, the teachers uh, you know, are a big part of that ceremony and something that we all look forward to to really enjoy the close to the school year. So. Thank you, and we'll see you then.
Thank you. Uh, admin review. Do we have anything? No, no yeah. need. Yeah. Uh, career and technical education. Anything on that? Thank you for meeting. No meeting. Uh, no chairman's meeting. report correspondence. Do I have any correspondence? <laughs> you got it all. Jason, do you have any on that? The unfinished Monday command day committee. Possibly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, legislative agents report. So hot off the press today, the Senate Ways and Means Committee, which is basically the final step before reconciliation of the House and the Senate before they send it on to the governor. They met today, they formed their version of the budget for next year and um, in honor of Mr. Creed, they did not meet their statutory requirement to fully fund <laughs> regional transportation at what we would estimate to be $86 million next year, they funded it at 62.5 million. However, as you know, I was at the Day on the Hill just last week um, where we were pressing legislators to fully fund Circuit Breaker, and I have some really good news that it looks like they're proposing to fund Circuit Breaker at the full 75%, which is the statute for next year. They currently have $318.9 million for Circuit Breaker for the next fiscal year. Also, um, they put $100 million in its charter school reimbursement program, which will give a little bit more relief to uh, schools that are losing massive amounts of children to the charter schools. Um, lastly, um, Rep Calter was here tonight uh, to give recognition to Mark for, for his service. Rep Calter has something that's called a legacy bill that he's going to leave behind on Beacon Hill. Um, his legacy bill is something that I think that MASE and we as the school committee here might want to take some action on. He has a bill that's very similar community preservation, but it's for school resource officers. So it would be a slight surcharge to property taxes. Communities would have to adopt it. There would be dispensation for those who were economically disadvantaged or elderly to not participate and towns that rose those funds would be matched up to 50% of those funds by the state to fund school resource officers and equipment in our local schools. Hmm. So I am willing to take on the charge of writing up a proposal for MASC's uh, resolution committee, which will happen in November, if you would so charge me as the committee. So I'd like to move. make a motion. All right, second. Does anyone want to second that? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you very you. much. Great idea. You <laughs> Are you done? All set. So I have a question. So I had reached out to Vinny uh, de Macedo, um mm -hmm. to see if I could get it. Could, uh, I've been unofficially working with other regional uh, school committee members. Laura has as well. There's a Facebook page for that. Um, one of the, the owners or admins of that page had, had put out a request that people get in touch with um, specific senators, Mr. Uh, Demacedo is one of them because he's on the uh, Senate Ways and Means Correct. Committee, and he would also be one of those to help. Um, and I'm not sure of the right terminology, but but uh, merging them back together. Um, reconciliation. Thank you, reconciliation. <laughs> my degree is in medical <laughs> computer science, so <laughs> that's what I bring to this committee, not my legislative experience. So. Um, I, I reached out and just was wondering if he would have time for a discussion. Have you worked with him at all in terms of having him, you know, push for regional transportation, the other things that we deal with? So um, one of the things I know about working with Beacon Hill is the staff is the senator. Yes. So if you get anybody from his staff on the phone to have a conversation with you, you are talking to the senator. Right. Um, I have had some interactions with him. He does return my emails and my phone calls. I'd be more than happy to, to assist. Um, we also have a division in MASC specifically for yep. regional schools. Yep. Uh, this is the little flyer we brought with our, our, ourselves to Beacon Hill, mm -hmm. um, asking for certain key points. One of the things we need to realize though as a regional school is we are less than one quarter of what the state has. Mm -hmm. So trying to get that block to vote together and bring on another 25% of the legislature, 
it is hard, which is why when I was up there, I mentioned it, but what I really pushed for was the circuit breaker funding. Right. Uh, I knew there was more people pushing for that, and we had momentum. So anything I can do to help, please let me know. I'm always willing to make a phone call or reach out. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, negotiations, employee relations, safety subcommittee. No. Uh, PAC. I don't have anybody here. <coughs> yeah. Policy. No. no. Revolving funds. Safer. Mark, you want to? We had a brief meeting this evening, and I'm, uh, my co chair was not able to make it, but we did have a uh, um, discussion um, so relative to uh, some proposals that came forward for the. Um, field lighting um, and also the, the, the solar um, and we reviewed our capital plan. I think that is the most important thing we got did tonight as far as uh, looked at what we have going out. Some big numbers are coming your way that you're going to have to uh, figure out how to to crack and I wish you luck, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, to say that. Um, but uh, as you as you go through that, some of those items I just say on your, on your capital plan are um, trends, uh, changes, major changes. So when you look at your HVAC, it, you look like putting a Band-Aid on it or you look at um, the kind of system we have today, make sure you take one more step back and look at, hey, maybe we need a whole different type of, of heating system or air conditioning system. Consider all your options because this has got some big items there. And I'll apologize for the last time on being on the building committees for both schools if there are any discrepancies. Just blame me later and it's fine. Bring it on the ropes. Yeah. I don't need to be here to take the blame. Just, yeah, it's Mark's problem. Thanks. That's it. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your last report on that. Yeah, that's the last one. Until you come back next year. That's right. right. You say, you know, <laughs> never say never. That's right. Uh, Mr. Creed, it did how many years? That's it. You got to catch up. Yeah. I've already been here and, and off twice. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have two stints. I can always do a third one. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, school start times. I don't think we have any time. No. Uh, treasurer's report. So thank you very much for filling out the reports. I know with the meeting today, they could have gotten lost in the shuffle, but they didn't. We had 13 warrants circulating the table for a grand total of $921,600. $84.40, and we also had one payroll warrant circulating the table for $710,126.11 for a grand total tonight of $1,631,810.51. And I'd just like to thank Paul uh, <coughs> for coming out today for OPEB and thank Grady for coming out for our audit. And Christine, as always, thank you for everything you do to help me understand my role. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Union 31, if you don't have any. We don't have any. We will have them probably this summer. Yes. We'll have one this summer. Um, we have a few contracts um, that are on yes. the that we'll, we'll need to, to discuss in the work. Okay. All right, so future meetings, dates to remember. May 28th, Memorial Day, no school. June 2nd, that's graduation. Um, June 14th, flag day, and my mother's birthday is the next school committee meeting here at the middle school again. Um, if there's nothing else, then I would entertain a motion. I've got, I got one comment, and I didn't want to interrupt your report, but it, it makes me proud that we have a young lady going to the United States Naval Academy. Yeah. And I have been here for 10 years and told every principal that you cannot leave this job until somebody goes to the Naval Academy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you did it. And, and not only that, but being, I was the first class in Annapolis with women. So it's even more special that it's a young lady that's going. And if I could possibly be at graduation, I would, but I'm, I've got a work conflict. Um, but I think that's significant, and uh, I wish her my best. And if there's any way I can get a, a contact, I'd just like to send her a well, note. Her, her I, father is yeah, Scott Milbert. Who was on oh. the school, elementary school committee. Oh, great. Please. Great, yeah. outstanding. So, and, and and please offer that I take phone calls and anything about it. And, and I just think it's awesome that, that it's, a, a, it's a great institution and she'll enjoy it. At this point, almost a third of the class is women. So it's it's amazing what has happened, you know, in, in my time. From 80 that started now, it's, a, it's not a minority at all at all. And it's a great, great career. Thanks. 
And with that, would you like to make the motion to? I'd like to make the motion to adjourn. <laughs> there we go. Do we have a second? Second. All those in uh, roll call, Jason? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Aye. Mark? Yeah. Yes. Roll Laura? Aye. 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 Aye.